Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, we are now start, ready to start the Glopedar Research Synergies meeting uh, on the transmission topic today. Uh, the full title of this uh, uh, meeting is Preparation for a Second Wave Understanding Transmission and How to Stop COVID-19. Uh, we've, uh, we're just coming off of a very successful couple of meetings last week on uh, vaccines uh, and therapeutics. Uh, and I'm here today to welcome you on behalf of Glopedar. Uh, my name is Charu Kaushik and I am the uh, CIHR Institute of Infection and Immunity Scientific Director uh, in Canada uh, and also one of the Glopedar co-chairs. Uh, gives me great pleasure to invite uh, my co-chair and the chair of uh, GLOPEDAR, uh, Dr. Yazdin Yazdin Pana, to give you a couple of uh, minutes of overview of GLOPEDAR. Uh, Dr. Yazdin Pana is the director of INSERM Reacting Consortium uh, and the INSERM Institute of Infection and Immunity, Microbiology and Immunology in Paris, France. So Yazdin, can I ask you to give your overview and then I will do a couple of housekeeping notes and hand it over to today's co-chairs. Thank you. Sorry, I was in mute. Thanks a lot, Charu, and thanks everyone uh, for joining us and thanks in particular to all the panelists and uh, chairs and speakers. Uh, so next slide, please. Uh, so in two minutes, I'm going to present what is GLOPIDR. So the GLOPO Research Collaboration for uh, uh, Infectious Disease Preparedness, it's an international network of research funding organizations that was launched in 2013 to facilitate, accelerate, and deepen collab collaboration among research funders uh, for emerging infectious diseases by investing to strengthen global research preparedness between crises, although we don't have that much between crises, unfortunately, and to mobilize resources to respond rapidly and effectively to significant infectious diseases outbreaks. Next slide. Global R currently has 29 members, as you can see all around the world, in different parts of the world, and two uh, observers from around the world. Next slide. Regarding the GLOPID R in the COVID pandemic, so uh, the members, observers, and stakeholders mobilized quite quickly uh, in the response. Uh, first of all, collecting information uh, from members on existing research activities on uh, uh, coronaviruses, but also in respiratory viruses. Um, uh, in Close collaboration with WHO Blueprint, uh, we set up pro priorities and defined a roadmap, in particular during the early February meeting with WHO in Geneva. Uh, funders launch emergency calls, European Commission, UK Medical Research, primary government funders, CEPI, BMGF, Government of Canada, welcome, and they coordinated funders to optimize resources to avoid duplication. And although there were duplication, we tried the best we can to try to uh, avoid them and to cover priorities that were listed in the road and, uh, and uh, in, in the blueprint research uh, roadmap. And before finishing, in February, January, we thought that it would be good to have a meeting in June or July between uh, the researchers who have been funded to try to find out where are the gaps, for the researchers to talk together uh, and to try now that we are in the middle or at the end of the beginning of the epidemic to try to uh, say where we should go from now. So thanks to everyone and thanks to in particular uh, to Gail and Josie and uh, to Charu for all of their works and also to Fondation Mario. Thank you. Charu. Thank you, Yazdin. So yes, welcome everybody. Uh, a couple of housekeeping notes. Uh, we have a, a very good registration today. Over 350 people have signed up for this. We are hoping that most of them will attend. So just to keep the, uh, uh, the session running smoothly, uh, 
we ask all the participants, if you have any questions that you want the co-chairs or the panel members to uh, answer, could you please use the question and answer box rather than the chat box? You're very welcome to use the chat box for your ongoing discussions, uh, but we will be closely monitoring the question and answer uh, box uh, and the chairs will pick up questions from there. So I ask you to do that. Uh, I also want to let everybody know that we are recording this uh, entire session uh, and it's also being webcast live on YouTube. So just for your information. Uh, and now it gives me great pleasure to introduce the co-chairs of today's session. It's such an important topic as uh, Yazdin was uh, referring to. So, and we have two uh, leaders in this area of transmission who will be co-chairing today's uh, session. Uh, Dr. Marian Koopmans is from the Erasmus Medical Center, Netherlands. She's the head of the Department of Vi Viral Sciences in Erasmus, and her research focuses on unraveling the modes of transmission of viruses among animals and between animals and humans, uh, and the use of pathogenic genomic information to unravel these pathways and to signal changes in transmission or disease impact. Uh, and our other co-chair, Dr. David Fisman, is from University of Toronto, Canada. Uh, Dr. Fisman is a professor in the Division of Epidemiology at the Dalai Lana School of uh, Public Health and Institute of Health Policy uh, at the University of Toronto. He is a practicing internist with a focus on infectious diseases. So I will hand it over to them. Uh, Marion, I believe you're going to start off first, so please take it away. And I look forward to the discussions. Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much, um, and uh, it's my uh, privilege to uh, start this session, and I've been asked to give a brief uh, uh, view of, of my perspective, from, from my perspective, and I will do that by finding to share the screen, just a moment. And if all goes well, you should be seeing uh, my screen now. So uh, as Charu just uh, mentioned, the, uh, the key topic of this session is to look at critical knowledge gaps uh, on uh, the uh, issue of trying to understand transmission with the somewhat ambitious subtitle title, how to stop uh, COVID-19. And this clearly is one of the most uh, uh, hotly debated uh, areas where we do see that because of the need for evidence-based uh, interventions, there is uh, uh, big discussions because of certain knowledge gaps, whether that is about the role of aerosol transmission, the source of the infection uh, and all sorts of theories. Uh, so clearly an area that needs uh, good data to help uh, understand how to uh, prevent or, and, and, and contain this uh, pandemic. So there are a number of knowns that I don't think have uh, are, are debated anymore. It is clear that SARS-CoV-2 replicates in the upper respiratory tract and spreads efficiently in uh, animal models. There is a shedding that uh, quickly peaks early uh, at the uh, start of symptoms and even a few days before that. Infection may be asymptomatic or very mild, possibly so symptomatic in the majority of people. And that's a problem um, because that is uh, uh, an insidious spreading virus. But infectious virus has been uh, detected up to three weeks in nasal swabs of people with severe symptoms, maybe slightly less in people with mild illness. But RNA can be detected much longer and that needs to be uh, taken into account when interpreting many studies. Virus is shed in stool and that's taken advantage of in sewage uh, surveillance uh, plants. And the virus, uh, unfortunately, is stable for prolonged periods of time uh, outside of its uh, host. We do also know that uh, SARS-CoV-2 is spread through droplets and that household and transmission and super spreading events are important drivers of the pandemic. Children, their, their role seems to be quite different from what we know, for instance, for, from influenza. Um, for reasons not yet fully clear and uh, 
also the age group where this epidemiology might be different is still to be fully understood. And there has been now clear evidence of forward transmission into animals, so both pets and farm animals, and that needs to be looked at. Now to the uh, unresolved or partially resolved issues. I think these are some of the key questions. What really happened at the start of the pandemic? Is this forward transmission to animals a problem, uh, including, for instance, the food chain um, uh, potential transmission? Uh, what is the relative contribution of droplets, aerosols, contact, contact transmission, and what is that? how do we look at that in different settings? And I will go into a little bit more of that. And also, uh, with this virus uh, diversifying, how do we recognize um, if there is changes in properties that are need that, that need some attention? Now, starting at the front end, so where this all started, there are still key outstanding questions, and Peter Desek will go into that. Was this a direct spillover? Was there something an intermediate host in between? Um, there is this uh, this lingering story of a laboratory escape. Um, but I will, but Peter will uh, elaborate a bit more on the animal side. And then uh, a few um, additional uh, slides on the very tough question about the contribution of aerosol, uh, aerosols in the spread of this infection. Um, it is clear this is an image from a recently um, uh, submitted publication that based on uh, the current state of uh, information from the literature has done some modeling work to try and put some foundation to the difficult debate in, uh, uh, in this arena. And that is looking at what is the role of smaller versus larger droplets in sp uh, and uh, in different type of activities in this um, uh, pandemic. One of the things that they looked at was uh, what is published regarding the uh, volume of aerosols that are produced with different types of uh, activities from breathing to sneezing. And uh, what is clear there that depending on that between breathing, so all these activities can lead to aerosol generation, but the uh, extent of that is quite different uh, with uh, sneezing at the highest end and breathing at the low end. But what is also clear is that there are wide margins, it's not necessarily margins of error, but margins of estimate, which also uh, speaks to individual variation in uh, and the so-called maybe person uh, super spreading events, person related super spreading events. What they also did in this uh, particular publication is take that information and then model. Okay, let's say if we put uh, sneezing, uh, coughing, and just breathing people in uh, a space the size of a bus or a larger meeting room, and if we model then what we know about kinetics of shedding of SARS-CoV from different studies, um, what is the probability that there will be, through aerosol generation, a, a, a transmission event in these settings? Now, very important knowledge gaps there is here that the, the data that they model by is based on, it says, a log 10 virus concentration, but it's really RNA concentration. Um, so that does not equate infectious virus. But the thinking is interesting. Um, what do we know about probability that RNA positive samples do contain uh, infectious virus? There's some, some budding literature uh, about that too, uh, here from two different types of studies that have looked at um, uh, the amount of infectious virus uh, by viral load uh, and by time since uh, symptom onset and by antibody titer, and that, that shows uh, some of the data that uh, at a certain amount of time, people do not shed infectious virus anymore, 
although they still can test PCR positive. Then adding to the complexity is of course the issue that people do not stand still or sit still wherever they are. There is a, a movement, there is ventilation that comes into the picture and how does that affect the, the dispersal of droplets, of aerosols, the contamination of surfaces. Um, again, with examples from literature that show uh, uh, what can be possible. Um, now, what is uh, not clear from many of the individual outbreak studies that have uh, suggested specific modes of transmission is um, uh, what, what really went on, so the combination with uh, sequencing. And here's an example of the type of picture that that may create. So this is a, a sequencing endeavor that looked at um, a number of uh, what seemed to be hospital outbreaks during the early ep uh, epidemic phase of this, uh, this situation in the Netherlands, where in fact, these were not healthcare outbreaks, but they were reflections of the fast increase of uh, spread in the community, not within healthcare uh, uh, amplification, but that may May, it may look like that if you if you look at it um, as a, a hospital outbreak. So message here is when in looking at the data, the published data, it's really important to uh, also add that component. Is this really an outbreak or is it a pseudo cluster that we're looking at? So that is, I think, the the big challenge that we have in this whole transmission space. Uh, there is actually so much on there. We have infected people, we have susceptible hosts with different types of susceptibility. We have aerosols, droplets, fomites, and um, uh, this is a complex mixture where we need insights from many different uh, areas of, of science to, to come to definitive conclusion with the overriding question can infection control and prevention be customized to specific settings, risk groups, and epidemiological situations? Um, then in this space, of course, there's also a lot of um, innovation in how to actually track um, this, the, the, these outbreaks, how, how to understand what exactly is going on here with an example from a, 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 an image in a paper that looked at the possible role of uh, tracking uh, apps, uh, which was also a big debate. Um, uh, and I gave this the subtitle, can we make transmission interventions? Can these be maximized in a societally acceptable manner? Which means also talking about how to use tracking devices, but in a uh, the, the, uh, being cognizant of uh, sensitivities and privacy. So um, I think this is my final slide, is that uh, what is quite clear is that what I think and, and many people think by now is that we really uh, see that we need uh, much more collaboration across disciplines to uh, to move to the next step. So instead of debating and challenging between engineering, public health, social science, trying to see what would a integrated a research agenda for the future uh, look need to look like. So this session, uh, as uh, said, uh, it will be to review the state of knowledge on key challenges uh, in this space combine perspectives from different uh, areas of expertise to identify key uh, knowledge gaps. And um, in uh, some of the slides that I showed, there is uh, funding that, uh, that we have received uh, from the European Commission and from uh, national uh, sources of funding. So with that, I will end uh, my presentation and uh, we take questions uh, probably later. Um,
Yes, uh, so um, I will ask my co-chair uh, to uh, also uh, give his uh, brief introduction. So David, please uh, uh, take over. Sure, thanks for that excellent presentation. That was really wonderful. Um, just before starting, I, I want to acknowledge um, that uh, our, our work is funded by CIHR, Canadian Institutes for Health Research, which has been tremendously helpful. Um, I don't think that I have control of my slides, so uh, I'll ask to go to the next slide, please. Thanks. So uh, I, uh, I'm going to talk about some of the paradoxes in transmission, and I've started, I started a couple of months ago referring jokingly to SARS-CoV-2 as Schrodinger's coronavirus uh, after the, the famous uh, uh, Schrodinger's cat uh, this thought experiment where the cat is both alive and dead at the same time until you open the box and look. And uh, once you see the cat, you realize that it's either in the alive or dead state. But there's this, this strange duality to coronavirus, which I think is, uh, has made this such a, a challenging pandemic to deal with. Um, paradox number one, it's a virulent pathogen with an infection fatality ratio that that rivals that of 1918 pandemic flu, 1%, one, 1%, 1 but it's also characterized by asymptomatic infections, mild infections, and, and uh, pre-symptomatic spread as well. Uh, we have what's called a Pareto distributed reproduction number, transmission with super spreader events, but also with lots of dead ends, as we'll see in a moment. So is it a highly infectious virus or is it a not that infectious virus? And the answer is both, it's context specific. And last, the, la the last paradox that I think is driving people crazy is this idea that the, the, this is a pandemic pathogen that somehow Marion alluded to this, skips over children, except that now we see in some locales, uh, resurgences seem to be driven by school opening. Um, next slide, please. Uh, I'm not sure if anyone gets the, the reference to the movie Full Metal Jacket, where, where the, the soldier talks about the fact that he has both born to kill and a peace sign on his helmet and uh, a general gives him a hard time and he says i'm it's the duality of man sir i was referring to the jungian thing um, but I, I want to talk about the duality of covid and it's important because when we have a virus that does different things in different settings it becomes very challenging to communicate nuanced public health guidance we have a lot of um, uh, uh, a lot more heat than light right now in Canada around the use of N95 masks and whether this is an, uh, an airborne pathogen, what, what we call it. We have this tremendous geographical variability in manifestations of COVID, including apparent severity and apparent ability to control outbreaks. And then we have a problem for public health leaders who say one thing and are then uh, confronted with a counterexample that sort of uh, uh, undermines earlier messaging, uh, and they're then accused of back, backtracking, caught in contradictions, which diminishes credibility and public buy-in. So I think the fact that this is a very heterogeneous disease is, is itself a major problem for public health messaging and disease control. Um, next slide, please. Oh, and next slide. So, so the virulent pathogen that also causes mild, mild illness. Next slide. This is uh, just some data from Ontario that I've done with a, the logistic regression model. These are, these are predicted um, um, case fatalities in Ontario um, from logistic models that account for both age and comorbidity. And you can see uh, on the, the, the left side panel is, is outside of long-term care and the right side panel is inside long-term care. But you can see this sort of marked a um, uh, very steep increase in, in, in case fatality that occurs with age. And in fact, you know, as we get to older individuals and individuals in long-term care, we're looking at case fatality uh, that, that, that's in the double digits, 20, 30, 40% potentially in long-term care patients. Next slide. Um, part of that, uh, but, but, at the, but at the same time, we have much lower case fatalities observed in some countries. We have lower case fatalities observed in some settings. We have a fair bit of transmission happening right now in Ontario, but our ICUs are empty. Part of this variation in apparent virulence simply relates to population age structure. This is some fourth 
upcoming work with Amy Greer and Ashley Chute, where we've 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 created we've created hypothetical epidemics in different countries with different age age structures. What we're doing in this in this exercise is we're running out the initial epidemic in China to February 11th, I believe is the end date, and taking those attack rates and applying them to different countries with different age structures. And what you can see is that you sim simulate the, the top dashed line is simulating the Chinese epidemic in Italy, which is a much older country. Um, the middle line is China and the bottom is, uh, the bottom dashed line is Indonesia. And then I've added Kyrgyzstan in this app, another country with a very low, uh, a, a very young population. And the virus looks very different depending on the fraction of older people you have in the population. Next slide, please. Testing capacity is also a key determinant of what we observe in terms of case fatality. This is some wonderful work that's in a preprint by Richard Gruel and Giulio DeLeo at Stanford. And what they've shown is uh, on the left, they have this lovely graphic, which is what we see. What we see is the tip of the iceberg with COVID. Uh, the tap is our testing capacity. As we open the tap more and more and more, we see more and more and more of the spectrum of illness of COVID. And they've taken this very simple observation, very intuitive observation, and used it in a rather brilliant way to show that if we, if we run testing out to infinity, uh, the case fatality would look like it would become the infection fatality ratio. And, so, and you can simply do that with a regression model. The intercept of your regression model is infection fatality if you look at the relationship between case fatality and testing rates. And that's this bottom panel here where they're, they're able to asymptotically estimate um, infection fatality as testing goes to infinity of about 1%, which is the same as what we see in the, in the Spanish zero prevalence studies. So I think quite credible. Next slide, please. Um, so the next paradox I want to talk about is that this is a non-infectious pathogen that causes super spreader events. Next slide. This is a, a lovely, um, um, a, a lovely network diagram that, that comes from the co.vid19.sg website in Singapore, where they've, of course, got some marvelous contact tracing infrastructure and skill um, and have turned, uh, turned that into a beautiful infographic that shows us what COVID really looks like in a country that's doing highly efficient contact tracing. And, and what we see is a lot of super spreading and a lot of clustering, these big clusters mostly being worker dormitories for, for migrant workers. Um, and this is recent, this is current. I took this off their website, I think yesterday. But um, next slide, please. But what we can see is this is some work by Jun Ling Ma and his colleagues. Jun Ling is here in Canada at University of Victoria. He did this with some colleagues in China looking at contact tracing in February in cases um, outside Hubei in China. And you see the same pattern already. So this has been before our eyes for a while, that this is a disease with a propensity for super spreading. We have giant clusters, and then we have tiny clusters and dead ends. Next slide, please. And if they look at the distribution of secondary cases per primary case, what you see is that it's Pareto distributed. So over on the left, you have about 30% of primary cases making zero secondary cases. And over on the right, you have a small number of uh, primary cases making three, four, five, six secondary cases. So we think that most of the secondary cases are coming from a minority of primary cases, which again makes this very challenging to control, very challenging to message, and very challenging to build policy around. Next slide, please. Um, there's a parallel. I wanted to, since there are a lot of smart people on this call, I wanted to throw this idea out. I think this, this may somewhat parallel what we've seen with gonorrhea. This is a sex, sex partner distribution for gonorrhea. Most people have relatively few sex partners. A minority of people have large numbers of sex partners. Uh, next slide, please. And when we express the reproduction number R0 for gonorrhea, as, as we would for any other um, uh, uh, infectious disease, we can conceptualize it as uh, probability of transmission per contact P times number of contacts C times duration of infectivity D. But what, what we've known thanks to the work of, of Heathcote in York in the 1970s is you can't just use average contact rates for a disease like gonorrhea that's profoundly heterogeneous. You need to actually use a variance weighted estimate to capture the contact rate. So we have a C effective, which is the mean contact rate plus 
weighted by variance divided by mean. And I wonder whether this is not possibly applicable to something like COVID, where what we need to do is actually not focus as much on mean contact rates as focus on, on the giant components of networks, the large crowds, the, the settings where uh, people are able to de facto connect with each other very efficiently, perhaps because those are the settings where airborne transmission occurs. Next slide, please. Um, another paradox, again, this goes back to February. It's been there in the data all the while. It seemed strange at the time, but it's real. Uh, th these authors showed that this is a strange disease where the interval between infections, it's the bottom panel, the generation time, um, is much shorter than what they'd estimate as the average incubation period, the time from onset of disease to, um, uh, to symptoms, which as they pointed out, and again in February, they pointed out that this means that there's a lot of pre-symptomatic transmission happening, which of course has been borne out by subsequent events. Next slide, please. So I, I think and this will follow up on Marion's uh, comments that I, I wonder whether, whether what we're talking about is as much as super, spre as super spreader people as super spreader settings. Uh, we seem to have a droplet borne pathogen that's conditionally airborne. Uh, we seem to have super spreader events that uh, according to Japanese data are often initiated by younger and asymptomatic individuals. And we have overrepresentation of certain kinds of venues which may be helpful in terms of policy gyms, clubs, bars, restaurants, long-term care, dormitories. Um, and maybe there's a role for HVAC. And I think we'll talk more about that uh, uh, in a bit. Next slide, please. And then lastly, I'd like to end up by talking about this sort of strange state of affairs with children and school-based resurgences. Uh, next slide. The kids do seem to be all right. Um, the silver lining to COVID-19 is that morbidity and mortality in kids appears far lower than in old, older folks. But asymptomatic infection, as, as Marion has noted, is a setup for, for insidious transmission. And right back early on in The Lancet in January was an account of, of tra a transmission event in a family. Uh, where one of the individuals with an abnormal CT scan was a 12-year-old who may have been the index case. It's, it's obviously hard to know who the index case was when you look at a family cross-sectionally. But, um, but, but, but minimally symptomatic infection does create a lot of hazard in terms of transmission because you can't recognize it and you can't intervene. Next slide, please. Uh, what we see here in Ontario is that the age distribution, having a younger age distribution um, of, uh, of cases is actually very protective. And sorry for all the panels here, uh, but on the top left, uh, you can see what our epidemic has looked like here. Uh, back in April, uh, the light blue area over on the left-hand side of the top left is our long-term care outbreaks where case age was very old. More recently, the disease has moved into, into the population under 40 and under 20, which is dark blue. But what we see is we can look at standardized testing ratios, standardized morbidity ratios for testing uh, by sex, and, uh, which is the bottom left panel, and see that we're profoundly under testing young people. So probably under recognizing in young people more than older people. In the top right panel, what we see is that the per test positivity in Ontario right now, red and orange, is highest in the under 40s. But that's okay, because if we look at this bottom right-hand panel, we look at the average age of cases, which has fallen over the course of the epidemic since our long-term care outbreak, our case counts, our hospitalizations, and our ICU admissions have all fallen as case age has fallen. So having a degree of, of, of circulation in younger people seems to be protective against um, uh, ICUs saturating and collapsing. Next slide, and I'll try and wrap up quickly. Um, I think we'll get into this. The, the, we, we, we've, we've noted that the, the paradox in kids not only relates to symptoms, but also relates to viral loads. This is a, a, a figure from Christian Drosten's group that's noted that younger kids do seem to have lower viral loads. They've noted that that may relate to how we are investigating, um, or that early on we were looking more at symptomatic individuals. Later on, we're doing more cluster investigations. He has also noted that this could be that we're finding index cases who are children later on when their viral loads have fallen down. They may have incited the family outbreak uh, 
and now their viral load is on the wane while everyone else's is high. And we just don't know yet. Next slide, please. And many countries do seem to have opened schools without evidence of amplification, such as the Netherlands. However, we've got data this week coming out of Korea suggesting that household transmission is most efficient in households in Korea when the index case is in the 10 to 19 age group. And we've got some question of whether Israel's recent resurgence over here on the right, the light blue line where they were controlling things rather well and have had a resurgence, whether that may have been touched off by school opening. Next slide, please. So pandemics are weird. They're weirdos. Um, I, I note that uh, the, the, this pandemic is following the script not exactly, but somewhat laid out by Mark Miller and Lona Simonson and, and Cecile Viboud et al. in New England Journal of Medicine 10 years ago. We're seeing waves. We're seeing geographic variation in severity. We're seeing odd age distributions. So check, check, check. Um, and we have a lot to learn. So, you know, in a sense, it's the best of times, it's the worst of times. Um, if I could get my last slide, I'll lead us into to where we're going this morning. We're gonna talk more about modes of transmission, air, surfaces, human, human animal interface, which is very exciting and interesting. Um, amplification, is amplification of transmission a, a function of settings? Is it a function of populations? We'll talk about non-pharmaceutical interventions, and then I think we have some excellent panel discussions coming up. So again, just to, just to reiterate what Gail said, please type your questions into the Q&A box, and we look forward to fielding them. And thanks very much. I hope I stayed to time there. Um, with that, I think I turn it back over to, uh, to, to Marion now to, to introduce our first speaker, if, I, if I'm not mistaken. Well, at least that's what I also thought. <laughs> so, at least then the two of us will be mistaken. No, we'll be wrong together. No, that's the uh, way to be. Yeah. Fine. So thank you very much for this um, uh, at times thought-provoking presentation. I jotted down some questions for you already. Oh, oh, great. Um, so we move over uh, to the uh, third speaker. Um, if you have an older program, there is still an, an additional person, but that was a late uh, cancellation, unfortunately, but uh, the next speaker will be Peter Daszak, president of the EcoHealth Alliance. That pretty much does not need an introduction, but it's an organization that conducts research and outreach programs on global health, conservation, and international development. Peter, floor is yours. Thank you very much, Marianne. Really interesting. And it's great to learn more every time I listen to your talks. Um, next slide, please. Um, I want to uh, talk now about the complexity that Marianne touched on about when we bring animals into this, um, this whole complex uh, milieu of, of how a virus transmits. Um, and let's start with a discussion about the origin of, of um, SARS-CoV-2. Um, it, we need to look at, I think, to look at this virus in the context of the human-animal interface. Um, SARS-related coronaviruses are animal viruses, uh, non-human viruses. They originate, it seems to be, in bats. Um, we found a huge diversity in China and across Southeast Asia of um, SARS-related coronaviruses, over 100 um, sequences. Um, within a greater uh, diversity of alpha and beta coronaviruses in insectivorous bats that live in caves, that, that fly close to people's houses, that live in, um, in livestock barns, and that are eaten um, and hunted and traded across the region. So there's a huge diversity of viruses. There's an incredible um, interface between bats and humans and other animals that we live in. So we need to look at, I think, the origin of of COVID-19 in a, a one health context. The interaction between people and animals in an environmentally changing situation. Um, and the other thing that's very interesting about these coronaviruses is of course that they infect a wide range of animals, uh, mammals, um, including of course um, civets, which are part of the mustelidae, a mustelid family that includes mink, um, raccoon dogs bred for fur across um, Asia, and ferrets, which are great animal models for um, SARS coronavirus. And many of these, much of this we knew about um, because of the SARS 
coronavirus outbreak in Guangdong, where a wildlife market with some of these animals in it um, uh, showed a, a diversity of species affected by SARS. We also knew from the SARS outbreak that cats um, could be infected and may even be part of the transmission. We now know from um, SARS-CoV-2 that cats, again, can be infected. Dogs, um, primates, obviously humans and, uh, and um, monkeys that are, that are um, used in, in lab animals to, to test like this. And now, intriguingly, pangolins. So we don't yet know how wide the diversity of species that can be infected with SARS-related coronaviruses is, or with SARS-2, then it may be incredibly diverse. And that, that leads to a problem for us for the future. Um, we know that some of the coronaviruses that we've discovered since the SARS outbreak likely can get into people directly. They, can, they have the right receptors to infect human cells. They can infect human cells in the lab and they can cause a SARS-like disease in the lab animal model, um, a, a, um, the, a modified, genetically modified mouse model. Um, and therefore, it's possible that SARS-CoV-2 moved directly from bats into people. Um, we know that SARS coronavirus um, affected this range of animals in the, in the wildlife market in Guangdong before it got into people, and it's thought that's the pathway uh, and we've seen this from a bunch of other diseases, Ebola, Nipah virus, Hendra, others, um, influenza, where a, a wildlife virus gets into an, a, a livestock species or a, a farmed species, a traded species, rapidly amplifies and then can become better able at infecting people, either by the sheer volume of virus produced by those animals or by adaptation of the virus as it evolves in that um, intermediate host. Very important to look at that to say, did this happen with um, SARS-CoV-2? We still don't know. Um, and there's this intriguing potential role of pangolins. The, the pangolin coronaviruses that have been discovered are similar to SARS-CoV-2. They're not the closest relatives. The closest relatives are in bats. But some of the genes in these, um, uh, the sequences of genes in these pangolin coronaviruses are almost identical. So maybe pangolins were an intermediate host. Maybe they were actually involved in the outbreak. They're traded widely throughout Southeast Asia, including China. Um, and maybe um, an alternative idea is that the, the viruses recombined uh, with bat viruses and pangolin viruses during the wildlife trade. And, um, and that's why we find these viruses. Next slide, please. So just to look at the diversity, and this is a, um, a sort of graphical illustration of the relatedness of different sequences um, discovered or known from bats mainly in China um, and note that there's been very little surveillance in other countries and we expect a huge diversity in countries neighboring China and others within Southeast Asia. You can see the SARS cluster on the right and you can see the SARS-CoV-2 cluster. Um, if you look at the SARS-CoV-2 cluster there are a couple of um, viruses closely um, allied to SARS-CoV-2 these are from insectivorous bats, and then you can see the pangolins a bit further away. What we're seeing here is a, a diversity of viruses, some of which are already pre-adapted almost to infect humans, others which can infect a variety of other species. Um, we expect there to be a, a much higher diversity. There's been very little deep surveillance within this group, and it may be that there are many, many hundreds out there. Next, please. Now, one of the problems, if you've got viruses now circulating in people on a global scale that are able to have a wide diversity in, in animals, what could happen is that this virus could then become endemic in countries in the wildlife populations, livestock, pets. And that's a huge concern because then if we control the outbreak in people, we'll see repeated spillovers from other animal species and it could lead to essentially an uncontrollable pandemic. Um, so there's already a lot of effort to look at this. Um, we, we think that bats in many countries could be infected and there are already bans or, or regulations to reduce exposure from people to those animals, cavers, bat researchers, and others that have contact with bats in the wild. And we've seen some from some excellent work um, that uh, Marion Koopman actually um, uh, did in the Netherlands that, and uh, now in Denmark.
that people working on mink farms have infected mink. They're mustelids. They're similar to ferrets and, and other species we know can be infected by SARS. They've infected mink on these farms and transmission appears to have then moved back into people. Um, we've seen cats infected, dogs, lions, tigers in zoos, and it's likely that the, the host range is much larger. Um, however, what's really interesting and important is whether these animals can transmit back to people. That's a key issue. Whether the virus can transmit among those animals and whether it can then uh, be produced in enough um, uh, dose and have enough contact to infect people and continue an outbreak. And from the domestic animal point of view, there's been a huge interest in the risk from cats. Cats in, in laboratory experiments seem to produce enough virus to transmit among each other in close contact and likely to people from some recent data. Um, but we've not got, seen any epidemiological evidence yet that that's happened, that cats have infected people. Um, dogs appear to have low level infections that they've picked up by snuggling up with um, infected people in their apartments and houses. There is this big issue over fur farms. Um, we've seen uh, recently the uh, efforts to cull nearly 100,000 mink in Spain. Um, there's been very little surveillance in other countries and it's likely that there are raging infections ongoing right now in farms in other countries. Uh, one big concern is uh, the raccoon dog and other fur animal trade in Asia, which is huge and diverse and connected. Um, and once these viruses get ingrained in that system, there are a couple of issues. One is that you get sustained transmission and that could allow um, evolution of adaptations that allow the virus to be better transmitted or even become more virulent. Um, you've also got the issue that if we control the outbreak in people, it can then resurge from those animals. Next slide, please. And this is a really nice piece of work. I recommend you read this paper. It's, uh, it's just a good outbreak investigation and shows what we need to do from a One Health perspective. And these are two farms in the Netherlands. And if you look at the um, timeline, it's um, workers infected, raise the alarm, and then the One Health team finds that there are mink in these farms infected. And it's the virus is transmitting readily among mink, that it, you can uh, find viral RNA in dust um, around the animals in the farms and in cats, stray cats, which are found in quite high density and move between um, farms and houses in a setting. This has been found in other outbreaks. The idea that feral cats could spread from one place to another. It's been hypothesized for other outbreaks, even Nipah virus in Malaysia. Um, but here we have really good um, uh, piece of outbreak investigation that shows that. And importantly, by the 28th of April, one of the workers, uh, one of the people who was staying at the farm became sick. So this, and, and the sequence suggests from the virus that that may have been picked up from the animals. Next slide, please. So we have this real issue that, uh, that animals can persist with this infection if we're not careful. So let's look at the gaps. Well, um, first, we really do not know what the true origin of SARS-CoV-2 is. We have viruses that are very close. A couple of viruses from um, horseshoe bats in South China that are close, but not the same virus. Neither are they the grandparent of SARS. 96.2% identity across a whole genome is a different virus. Um, it's likely that these viruses originated in South China or even the bordering countries, Myanmar, Laos, Vietnam. Um, there's been very little surveillance there. It's highly likely that if we go out there and look for those, um, into those bats, we will see viruses that are much closer to SARS-CoV-2 and we'll find the origin site and then potentially the communities which are making the connection with those wild animals. Um, it's possible, given this incredible wildlife trade in South China and the, and the neighboring countries, that SARS-CoV-2 spilled over to people um, at the beginning of the wildlife trade in these rural areas and then transmitted through those, those people's um, social network across the wildlife trade into the market in Wuhan. Another possibility is that animals that are farmed, wildlife that are farmed and supplied to markets in the cities were infected. And that's how the virus got into Wuhan. 
And then there's also the possibility that the virus was circulating in bats around Wuhan and was actually present in people earlier, back into the summer or autumn of that year, uh, 2019. So again, a lot to be done. And we're hoping that the WHO team now out there in China, planning and, and analyzing how we could move forward in that will help a great deal to move this forward. And um, this huge network of wildlife farms has already been um, uh, under new legislation from the um, Chinese government, who are really, uh, really seen keen and, and determined to reduce the wildlife trade. Um, but there's an issue there that we still have rural populations in Southeast Asia that are exposed at a sustained basis, even without involvement of the wildlife trade. So we're gonna need more vigilance. Um, but right now there is not global surveillance of places where we expect COVID to um, circulate in animals, fur farms, wildlife farms, zoos, people who work with livestock in zoos with breeding domestic animals, breeding uh, uh, livestock, uh, wildlife in farms. Uh, those people could be getting infected and driving future outbreaks without our knowledge right now. We also know very little right now about the role of pangolins. It's likely to be honest that they didn't play a significant role in the driving this outbreak because pangolins are so rare in the wildlife trade as live animals. They're mainly um, traded as scales that are dried and probably unable to sustain viral transmission. But more needs to be done on that. Next slide, please. And finally, what can we really do to understand this? And, and I think a lot of this goes back to two things, basic surveillance and sampling of viral discovery. Going out into these sites where we think the virus originated, looking at bats, looking at other wildlife, and finding the viruses that are the progenitor for SARS-CoV-2, and others that could potentially emerge in the future. Um, doing serological testing of animals and people in wildlife farms in Southeast Asia. It, it's, it might be that the virus has already been cleared from those animals, but we could still find antibodies to it. Um, that will include some um, clever diagnostic testing and, and the development of assays. Um, we need to look at that on a sort of global scale for wildlife farms across the region, in other countries too, including as we've seen in Europe and, and uh, North America, Latin America, Africa, um, and also in, in unexpected places like zoos and, and, uh, and people who breed domestic animals, the pet industry, um, etc. And there's already a lot of concern in those groups. I think a really important thing to do is to look at this, a combined sort of one health approach between the serology of communities that live close to animals and wildlife in the region where this thing originated and to look at both the people and their behaviors to try and link the two so we may be able to hone in on specific communities specific risk pathways that drive emergence and finally we need a lot more information on the um, uh, genomic characterization of uh, related viruses from bats and other potentially intermediate hosts like pangolins. Um, so we can rule them out or hone in on them if, if they're the key um, risk. Um, there is a lot of experimental data going on, mainly from a, trying to design good lab models to, um, to trial vaccines and drugs. But that then provides useful information on what the likely host range of this pathogen could be. And I think a coordination between the people doing surveillance and doing the lab animal infections would be very useful. And finally, just to drive home this message, One Health has real value here. It's not just a, a, a concept that sounds interesting. This is exactly what we need to do to protect human health. Because if this virus does become sustained in um, a, a series of wildlife farms or livestock, somewhere in the world, um, it will lead to um, right now unexpected and significant um, resurgence in people, even if we control the outbreak in cities and towns. And that's important for our health too. Thanks very much. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Peter. Um, and uh, we are going to open up the presentations for questions, but that will be part of a bigger panel discussion. So let me first introduce the panelists.
Um, and uh, I'm not sure I'm, I'm asking the, the organizing team now if we will have uh, the people's faces on the screen, because that, that might be nice. Yes. Um, but the first panelist is, and I'm very sorry if I mispronounce your name, Mugai Cevic from the University of St. Andrews. She's a clinical uh, expert in infectious diseases and medical virology. And she has been advising on international clinical trials on shortening drug resistant TB treatment and is currently an investigator uh, on a CSO funded COVID-19 household transmission study, uh, which uh, uh, should be good to discuss. Our second additional panel member is Lucas Engelman, Engelman from the University of Edinburgh in the UK. And he is a Chancellor's Fellow and Historian of Medicine and Epidemiology at that university. And the third uh, is Charles Haas from Drexel University in the USA. And, and he is Professor of Environmental Engineering and Head of the Department of Civil Architectural and uh, Environmental Engineering at Drexel University. So welcome to the panel. And thank you for joining us. And we have uh, approximately half hour to discuss some of the uh, topics uh, following the presentations and, and uh, uh, other uh, issues that may come up. So maybe let me start first with a few questions that I picked up from the chat for uh, the speakers, uh, starting well, I would say at the source of all things with Peter Daszak. <laughs> um, Peter, um, there were some questions about how do you look at the issues with, with fruit bat related problems. Uh, these are of course different bat related problems. Um, and we have of course heard the need for surveillance. You have been quite uh, successful in these uh, virome uh, survey studies but how do we organize it so it becomes um, as informative as possible? Uh, how do we make this type of surveillance really uh, part of the public health uh, uh, toolbox? What are your thoughts there? Yeah, great question. I, I think that we, we have an opportunity to do exactly that. Um, doing surveillance in wildlife nowadays is not a simple case of you send a team out into the um, to the forest and catch whatever you can. Um, we actually target where to go very carefully and which species to look at. We have a sample size target um, and if we um, don't achieve that we don't we, we know we won't have the power to analyze the the reality of those viruses. Um, we can look at um, viral discovery curves, we can look at how many samples um, over time have we found with new viruses in uh, versus the refining old ones and sort of predict the unknown diversity in that group and then discover it. So there's a huge amount we can do using an analytical type of ecology along with field sampling and viral sequencing. Um, if we did this on a systematic basis, we would be very much better informed early on in an outbreak as to where it came from and where it potentially is still circulating. And it's not just an academic exercise. Um, in, in the case of um, other zoonotic outbreaks, uh, if the source of the, pan of the um, outbreak is still present, if people are still making contact with a farmed species or a, um, a series of bats that, that live close to humans, then the, the um, pathogen will continue to spill over and we can spend a huge amount of energy to control the outbreak in a city nearby, the minute we, we take our foot off the gas, the virus will come back in. Um, so this is critical for um, control, for preventing spread and amplification. Um, so I do think there's a lot we can do, and I think we need to do that. So I'm, I'm looking forward to, as we come out of the initial um, huge energy we're putting into COVID control right now, we'll start to plan ways to, um, to solidify that strategy in the way we control future outbreaks. Thank you. Sorry, maybe a follow-up question is, do you uh, think it 
uh, we would need to have an active screening of the animal species that you mentioned uh, from the fur producing industry, given the situation in Europe. Yeah, um, and you know, again, we can't rely on um, academic interest or um, you know a, a clinical uh, um, outbreak investigation where you have the good fortune of having veterinarians involved. We need to have these One Health teams in every outbreak where we think there might be an animal connection. We should be doing um, standardized proactive surveillance, not just in the animals in these farms on a global scale, but also in the people who work with them. Um, what we find with, with, um, with emerging diseases is that there is a, a, a continual pressure to spill over from these viruses once they're endemic in an animal population. And it's certain key risk behaviors that drive that spillover. If we can um, hone in and find out who it is who has the most contact with those species and do surveillance in them, we, we're better able to control the beginnings of an outbreak. So yes, it needs to be a joint human and animal surveillance um, targeted and really anywhere where there are um, uh, species bred for fur, for food, that we know can be infected by COVID. Okay, thank you, Peter. Uh, maybe shifting gears a bit, um, I saw a series of questions uh, around the uh, issue, of course, with children. And David, you mentioned uh, some of that. You also mentioned there is uh, maybe somewhat conflicting evidence coming out of the, uh, the, what we see, coming out of the literature, coming out of the national reports. Yeah. Uh, there was a comment that uh, based on the Sweden situation, the assessment is that the that children do not play right. a big role. Same for the Netherlands. There's now the paper <laughs> from Korea that would suggest that may only apply for the uh, up to 10 year olds. Can you, um, uh, so, yeah. so how do we move to the next step? What is the critical knowledge that we really need to get these questions answered? So I, 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 I just, I think, answered this question from Nicola Lowe, uh, but I don't know if I did it privately or publicly, but I think this is, this is such a key question. You know, I, I think several of us, and we'll hear from Amy soon, have been saying for a while, Schools are the one mass gathering that's very, very difficult to cancel, you know, for economic reasons, for social reasons, for psychological reasons in kids. Um, it's, it's excruciating. We're coming to this from knowledge from influenza, which is obviously a different disease. But when we think pandemics, we think influenza. And we do have data from both seasonal influenza and pandemic influenza suggesting that waves get touched off by school, school opening. Um, and now enters COVID, where we have these funny age distributions, some of which may be due to biological factors, some of which may be due to under-testing. Um, as I said, the, the, the Sweden-Finland comparative report, which I think came out two days ago, um, looks at the, the potential contribution to, to amplification in Sweden, which did, which did not close its schools, and Finland, which, which did and finds no difference in the degree to which kids sort of amplify, amplify infection. That's an incredibly helpful data point and we're starved for data. We know in the Netherlands, there doesn't seem to have been much impact opening schools. Denmark doesn't seem to have had much impact opening schools. Israel, my comment about Israel relates to a media report and I haven't seen the actual data where the, there was fairly aggressive school reopening, to, which, which seemed you know, to, uh, uh, to be correlated with a subsequent, uh, both amplification within schools and then, and then a surge in a country that had controlled its epidemic quite well to date. So I, you know, I think when we're puzzled, when we don't know, and this again, I think epitomizes the idea that this is Schrodinger's coronavirus, maybe it's both, or maybe we just don't understand yet. I think that's, that's how we know we need to study the, pardon my language, we, we need to study the hell out of this because this is a critically important policy question. We don't understand it. It's hard to study because kids are hard to do NP swabs on uh, and, and kids don't present with, with, with clinical illness. So they're not sort of showing up asking to be swabbed. I think we really, really need to study this hard and figure it out because it's, it's critically important for economies and for societies to get kids back to school safely. Yeah, 
So I don't know. I'm wondering if maybe uh, Muge can, would like to comment a bit, uh, since you are involved in household transmission studies. Um, what is your take on this? What is the key uh, way of addressing uh, these important questions, according to you? Thank you. Um, I just wanted to kind of follow up on what David said about you know, interesting discussion and comparison between Sweden and Finland. Although that's um, quite intriguing to kind of come up with a conclusion, I think I feel that Scandinavian countries are a little bit different than other countries. And the other thing which uh, David initially mentioned is the testing. So when we look at the data, you know, children made up about 8% of total number of cases in Finland, whereas it was 2% in Sweden. So schools were open in Sweden, you would expect no smaller number of infections in Swedish children. So right. overall, it seems like in Sweden, you know, um, infected child was four times less likely to be detected compared to infected child in Finland. So I guess uh, we need to look at everything from a kind of, you know, testing perspective. Uh, but there, there's uh, some data coming up uh, showing that there are differences in different age groups, even in children, you know, less than 10, 10 to 15, 15 over 15 years old, uh, potentially social contacts uh, and, uh, you know, mixing in age, different age groups are different. Um, from household studies, uh, what we're kind of uh, finding is even within the same household, the infection risk uh, transmission risk is different. So for example, the spouse generally has a higher risk of, um, you know, transmission compared to a child because potentially adult, adult contacts are much more sustained and much more close compared to a child adult connection uh, and contact. So I guess we still need to find out a little bit more about different environments uh, different contacts. We still don't know much about infectivity uh, of especially different groups in children. There are very, very little data. I think we're kind of understanding a little bit more about the susceptibility, but uh, the data about infectivity, you know, how much one age group transmits to other is still not clear to me. I don't know whether any other panelists wants to uh, comment. Well, okay, thanks a lot. So I guess uh, you sort of started opening the discussion on um, what contributes most to transmission, because a bit of the discussion of the role of children is also related to the question, how important is transmission uh, from asymptomatic individuals? Um, uh, and uh, that also touches upon the, 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 the role of the different types of uh, contact transmission, aerosol, uh, droplet transmission. So we have um, Charles Haas on the panel. I'm quite interested to hear a perspective from, perspective from someone from, with an engineering background on this um, transmission dilemmas or puzzle. Um, would you would you care to comment? Sure. Well, let me comment specifically on the schools and open up a question. So, not all not all school classrooms, not all school buildings are the same. And so, you know, I think before one makes broad comparative judgments uh, differentially across countries, it's probably important to look at the nature of the a school venue itself and the conditions that may have in, um, in affecting transmission pathways. Uh, you know, we're still, at least in the Northern Hemisphere, we're still um, in summer. I don't know, and maybe you know, David, what the condition of ventilation is in the Israeli school systems and whether or not um, that could be a differential between what's been observed in Scandinavia. Yeah, no, I, I don't know anything about that. Certainly, the, you know, the question of air conditioning as you see COVID kind of take off like a rocket in the summertime in parts of the United States where summertime means get inside where it's air conditioned. 
is very intriguing. And, um, you know, it's obviously an ecological observation, but it's hard to imagine why they're having summertime explosions in Texas, Florida, and Arizona if it doesn't have something to do with getting inside with air conditioning, combined obviously with some suboptimal policy. Um, it's, a great, it's a great question. So, I, but I think this, is, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to tease out. So what are some of the types of studies that we need? Because we oh. all know these are hugely challenging. We know you can have uh, synthetic droplets uh, be made. You can see that the viruses can remain infections in them, can be transported over a certain amount of uh, uh, distance. But how do we really do these studies? Oh. Uh, I, I, I think, Marion, part of it is alerting people who do the investigations to the need for critical metadata on the venues that need to be collected. You know, what are the parameters of ventilation? What are the flow patterns in indoors? What might be, in the case of schools, I've been thinking a lot about how people move. How are the movement patterns? being controlled in a complex building to either minimize or have no effect on contact between individuals. I think that's the sort of what I would frame metadata that needs to be developed in any of the studies and investigation. I know, uh, without putting you on the spot, but I know that uh, Maria is on line. Maria, are you? Would you be, care to, to add a comment? Or does the engineering profession, uh, can, can it be brought into the standardized outbreak investigations? Hi, Marian. Uh, hi, everyone. Yes, absolutely. I mean, I think we must take a multidisciplinary approach to these outbreaks. I mean, I think from my point of view, it's really important that when we think about transmission, we think not only about how in terms of the modes of transmission, but we think about when uh, transmission is occurring in terms of the course of someone's infection, whether they have symptoms or not, because we know people can transmit without symptoms as well as with symptoms, as well as the setting. Um, and setting takes into, into consideration the context in which people come in close contact with one another, the intensity in which people are in, in, in contact, and the duration. And I think that the outbreak investigations that do take place really must look at this in a much more holistic approach. Um, I think all of us are really fascinated by these really excellent studies that are coming out looking at these super spreading events. And again, I would urge us to be careful in our communication around the word super spreaders versus super spreading events. Um, because I think that we, we are unfortunately in many situations facilitating the spread between individuals when we have closed uh, settings, when we have poor ventilation, and when we have a lot of different um, aspects. And I would like us to move away from it's just airborne or it's just droplet or it's just fomite. It's likely a combination of all of this. Um, and we really need these studies to be done. So it's a long-winded answer to say absolutely all different disciplines must be engaged in designing these studies and carrying out these studies. Um, and only to add that we don't need to do these studies in every single country. We just need really well-designed studies in some different settings. Um, if we think about schools, if we think about meat processing plants, if we think about um, expat dormitories, I know Dale is on the line. If we think of these types of closed setting, long-term living facilities, if we do them very well in a couple of countries, we can gain a huge amount of knowledge in terms of policies to prevent them going forward. Thanks, Marian. Okay, great, Maria, thank you. Um, so I guess maybe part of the challenge is to how to capture, because there certainly is a lot of debate, uh, scientific debate, this public debate on several of the topics that we are uh, discussing here. Um, and I'm quite interested to hear uh, Lucas Engelmann's perspective on how can we uh, take that debate, the challenge, but move from the somewhat polarized situation to a, a path where, where we build those kinds of uh, challenges into how we move forward. It, do you have some thoughts on that? Do you have some advice on that? Are there some parallels from your historic uh, 
perspective, historian perspective? Well, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation. And it was an um, absolutely fascinating panel to, to listen to you and to I've, I've, I've learned an enormous amount and dotted a lot of notes in various ways. I think um, I, I might have some thoughts and I might have some questions. I might have to add a little bit to the layers of paradoxical complexities that is part of this epidemic. Um, I just been told that I, I'm not visible here. Can you see me? Yeah. Ah, okay, I'm told I'm back. Um, adding to the complexities, but also I think I'm 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 generally very skeptical when it comes to to drawing lessons from from history. So it's more of uh, looking at at COVID nineteen as a way to revisit maybe many of the histor histories of pandemics and to rethink some of the things that we might have taken for granted. I think is 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 very much my 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 perspective here or my pathway here. What I what I take away from 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 all the previous speakers is this 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 large scale transformation that we that we all I think part of of trying to develop a more specific focus on how to control this epidemic to move away from blanket measures to move away from lockdowns and to get a better understanding of and I think that was mentioned a couple of times of the of the customization of infection control and the customization of what is it that, it, where, what are the specific settings, the specific risk groups in which transmission occurs. And of course, when I hear these kind of concepts or these kind of perspectives, there are a lot of historical examples that we might turn to, to take, to think very carefully about how we phrase and how we frame both the places that we understand to be particularly prone to, to bring uh, infection forward, but also in particular when we think about categories of risk and how we define categories of risk. And I think there, there are two challenges in the ongoing epidemic or two challenges that I would point out, there are probably a lot more. And one of the challenges is, 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 is just the fast pace. And I really like David's uh, introduction of the, the paradoxical nature of the, 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 uh, the uh, um, many of the facets of this epidemic, in particular, the, that, that man, many of the things that we take for granted are not particularly useful a couple of weeks later, and that we understand uh, uh, the virus and its transmission in certain ways, while in other areas it looks very differently again, and you have these kind of like different uh, compartmentalized geographies and the different kind of perspectives that are standing next to each other. And I think one way really here is to ask like, what are our concepts of risk and what are our, our, our attributions of risk without becoming fixed concepts, without becoming fixed ideas of populations, without becoming fixed ideas of, 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 of a vulnerability and vulnerable population. And I think over the last few months here in the UK, we have seen a lot of discussions where this idea of who is vulnerable to the epidemic has been spilled out into the public, has been made into kind of like a concept. It's this kind of group that has needed to be shielded in these kinds of ways, only to see a few weeks later that actually these kinds of uh, um, assumptions were maybe a bit, uh, a bit, a bit uh, um, not well thought through or not well thought out and needed a lot of revision. And so, so how do we develop a concept of risk and risk group and super spreader uh, uh, um, places or super spreading settings while allowing for a certain contingency to go on while still maintaining an idea that these might be concepts and ideas that might not stand and might not hold within the next few weeks or next few months. And I think that's a huge challenge in this pandemic. It has a lot to do with the, um, with the with the with the fast pace also of the scientific reaction to the pandemic it's not just the nature of the pandemic itself it's also the part of how we cover it and how we engage with it and my second point i think and it's very much related to that is 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 the question of how we then organize community involvement and i think that's a it's a huge open-ended question also for myself if there is so much uncertainty about who are the specific places and specific groups of transmission, how do we get these groups involved? And how do we get these groups to keep, or how do we keep an open invitation to the involvement of these groups, not only as surveilled and observed specimen, but also as participating researchers and participating experts? And that I think is the challenges that we also need to, need to address here.
Um, okay, thank you. So I think you have I've been wondering about the term personalized public health. Uh, I think we may need to start coining that and maybe personalized public health in or situa situationalized public health interventions, something along those lines, but more fine grained uh, uh, ways of, of moving forward is what I'm hearing everyone here say. Um, I wonder, I would like to, uh, because we, we are trying to also put together some advice for the GLOPIT, for the funders, if the people on the panel had to give their one sentence pitch for the key knowledge gap to address, key knowledge gap and key discipline to involve, what would it be? Uh, and I want very short answers here because we are moving to the next uh, session. Uh, so Lucas. I think we need, we need the social sciences to stay sensitive to the changing picture on the epidemic on the ground and to develop and build an archive of the epidemic while it is happening and while we engage with it because it's changing so fast. And who from a different discipline would be the first you would involve? Because social science, I, I say, is your discipline, your... your <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, I thought that was the question. Um, both. Two questions. From a different discipline, I think it would be, uh, I wouldn't concur with the, with, the, with the engineering perspective. And I think engaging with architecture and urban design more broadly would be incredibly important to, to understand some of the protection and prevention that we need to develop. Okay, thanks. Chuck. From a different discipline, well, actually, I think Lucas and I are going to trade here. I, I think there's a very developed field of risk communication um, that has a scientific underpinning to it, and bringing in people who understand risk communication and how to do it well, even in the face of uncertainty, is, is very important. Okay. And your favorite knowledge gap to be addressed? Well, I, I would also work you know, add the, you know, the building science aspect, because it does appear to be significantly focused on the indoor environment, and there's a, a big field of building science and engineering out there. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, I think I just wanted to say two things. When we're basically reviewing the contact tracing studies, to understand the modes of uh, transmission. Main thing uh, which was missing is uh, the number of contacts. For example, we don't know the denominator or we don't know where exactly the transmission event occurred or it's not clear who's the index case. And the terminology is sometimes very confusing. For example, some studies say the index case was an asymptomatic person but whereas it, it was not, you know, uh, and this basically creates a lot of confusion. And um, looking at the literature, there, there's a wide range of different terminology used. So I guess we, my main thing would be to use consistent and much more standardized terminology uh, to, to talk about transmission, to talk about asymptomatic person, uh, when we talk about, you know, secondary attack rate, how do we define a secondary attack rate? I mean, without a denominator, we can't know that. So, and most of the contact tracing studies are missing either or uh, these, uh, you know, important uh, figures. Okay, so, I'm going to cut you short. Your which discipline? Um, it's... I guess like uh, in order to understand modes of transmission, we need to understand, uh, we, we need better contact tracing studies. I would like to involve field epidemiologists. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay, <laughs> David. Um, I didn't know I got to answer this. So, so what needs to be studied more? You probably guessed what I think is, is schools and children. Uh, which discipline really smart virologists like you to develop uh, paper strip based saliva based tests so that we don't have to uh, stick uh, long pointy objects into the noses of small children? 
Um, I, I, I think field tests that are accurate and easy to do in kids would be an absolute godsend. Okay, thanks. And Peter? Well, I, I think we've got a fundamentally critical moment on our planet. <clears throat> We're in the pandemic era. We've shown proof of concept that you can predict and po potentially prevent pandemics. Yet we sit here waiting for a vaccine after the pandemic emerges. If we adopt a One Health approach, if we do bet a better job of surveillance, focusing in rural areas, where the first communities who are vulnerable to these diseases spilling over first get infected by focusing on wildlife and discovering the viruses that can transmit, we can prevent pandemics. And I think that's where we need to focus. And in terms of the discipline, I think one discipline that really, I mean, social scientists are hard for lab scientists and ecologists to work together with social scientists and understand each other. But that's what we're gonna have to do. One Health requires that. It requires respect among the disciplines and an understanding of the timescales through which diseases emerge. And economists too, bringing their understanding of incentives that drive behavior, that drive risk. If we're really gonna beat the pandemic here, we're gonna to need to bring all those together in a more systematic and standardized way. Okay, well, thank you. <laughs> I, I know you agree with that, Marion. I do. I will work with you and with Dale. And with everyone. <laughs> yeah. um, but thank you very much for this. Uh, we have reached uh, the uh, end of our time slot uh, for this particular uh, session. But thanks very much to all the uh, uh, panelists and presenters. And uh, you receive a digital applause here. And uh, I'm handing over to uh, David uh, for the next session. Sorry, just unmuting. Thanks so much. That was wonderful. Um, so, so it's it's my my pleasure and my privilege to uh, introduce our next session, which is is going to be on potential amplification amplification settings or populations. Um, again, each speaker will have ten minutes, um, and uh, uh, please please use the question box, and we'll have a discussion afterwards. Our two speakers will be. Um, uh, a pair of marvelous friends, Amy Greer and Christian Altus from Canada and Switzerland res respectively. And then we'll have a panel discussion at the end, which will we'll, we'll have Muge back. And we're also very privileged to be joined by Kai Kupferschmidt from Science Magazine, uh, Greg Gonzalves from Yale University. Uh, I, I don't, uh, Greg is unclassifiable. I'm not sure if he's a lawyer or an ethicist or an epidemiologist or all of those. And Dale Fisher from, uh, from the, the National University of Singapore. So very lucky to have this panel. Um, uh, so, so perhaps I'll start off by, by, by introducing Dr. Greer. Uh, Dr. Greer is another uh, 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 human Swiss army knife. Uh, she is an, a disease ecologist who comes from the world of animal disease, uh, moved into human disease with us at Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto, has worked in public health in um, Public Health Agency of Canada, and she's now a tier two Canada research chair in population disease modeling and an associate professor in the Department of Population Medicine at Ontario Veterinary College, which is at the University of Guelph here in Ontario. And with that, I will, I will turn the, the microphone over to Amy. Great, thank you, David. Um, so I'll just move immediately on to the next slide. And we've already talked a little bit about um, COVID in children, um, but let's talk about schools as a, as a potential setting for amplification. So we know that school is important. You know, the impact um, is especially severe for the most vulnerable children and their families. Um, closures exacerbate um, existing disparities, and there are certainly physical and mental health harms associated with um, prolonged school closures such that we've seen to date. Um, we also know, and this has been getting um, a lot of media attention, especially recently, um, that there is a disproportionate impact on working families and especially women, where now the conversation has focused on um, issues related to individuals um, potentially leaving the workforce um, if their children are, are having to, to remain at home as we head into fall 2020. And so uh, if we move to the, the next slide, 
so certainly there are risks associated with reopening schools and those risks, um, as many speakers have already identified, um, are very challenging to quantify. And I think one of the things um, that continues to come up is that those risks are highly dependent on the amount of community transmission that's happening um, within the setting and also public health's ability to maintain testing, uh, timely contact tracing and isolation and so we know that those are associated with um, more, if we want to call them successful outcomes. You know, we know that schools are settings that amplify the transmission of other respiratory pathogens like influenza, um, RSV, uh, other types of pathogens that we know of. Um, and we do know that there is, um, there are differences in terms of countries that have reported um, having opened schools you know, many places have opened schools, but it's really difficult to know what the actual outcome of those school openings has been. Um, in many places, the it, it's there has been an unclear impact on the transmission dynamics. Um, most of what we know seems to be coming from media reports, which is uh, less than ideal. Um, and there is a high level of variability associated with the interventions in place. We know that some countries have um, return students to school in the context of very low community transmission um, with, um, you know, very minimal um, infection prevention and control strategies in place within the school setting. Um, and that ranges quite dramatically to other countries where they have opened schools. Um, we have seen um, increases in community transmission and those schools um, have also implemented different types of infection control strategies in the school setting. Um, but it's very difficult to, to get detailed information on what's happening um, within each of these schools. We also, what's been documented and, and already mentioned, is that there are differences and, and there are important differences that appear to be coming out between younger and older age groups. So even when we talk about children, um, all children do not appear to be the same in terms of what that age split looks like. Um, are we looking at differences in very young children versus kind of older preteens or adolescents? Where do, do children become more like adults in terms of transmission dynamics? So if we move to the next slide, what we do know about COVID-19 in children, um, for which I think you know, many of us would agree um, is that most children do appear to exhibit mild clinical illness. Um, however, um, some children will experience severe outcomes and there is also um, clinical data related to this COVID-19 associated hyperinflammatory shock in children, which has been documented in a number of settings. Um, and there are also some papers which suggest that there are long-term consequences of even mild infections um, but, you know, for a virus that, that we have only seen in human populations um, for a very short time period, it's very difficult to know whether or not those long-term consequences might play out and what that might look like. So on the next slide, you know, I think this is where things start to get a little bit fuzzier is when we start thinking about the ability of children to become infected and to transmit their infection to others. You know, one of the challenges when we interact with public health decision makers um, is that people see these types of headings uh, in the press. And this becomes very challenging um, for um, families to interpret um, when parents and families are thinking about sending their kids back to school and they read news articles um, with headings like this. How are we to interpret? And, um, you know, I heard somebody recently refer to it as science by um, you know, headline, and many of these are, are based on preprint studies um, with, with not a lot of, of context or nuance around what the data actually show. And so we know that um, people hold very strong opinions. You know, sending children back to school is not going to be a zero risk situation. And so trying to understand those risks and recognizing that all families um, and households are going to have a somewhat different uh, risk threshold for what amplification um, might look like in school settings. You know, the challenge, as others have already mentioned as well, is that 
Um, it's exacerbated by the fact that most children do experience mild infections, which may go unrecognized, um, which makes um, interpretation of the data difficult um, because of, of the fact that that creates a testing bias. Um, and that most children, we've also created this um, artificial situation where most children have been under um, quite significant and aggressive physical distancing measures um, where many children have been at home and having very little contact um, by virtue of the fact that school has been um, put on hold in many locations. And so making opportunities for infection in those groups quite a bit less as well. So if we move on to the next slide, you know, there is, um, again, quite a bit of debate about the question of susceptibility of children to COVID-19. And, you know, there are many different um, studies that have been published, uh, specifically looking at household transmission studies, um, surveillance data, um, reports coming out of different countries. You know, it seems that children and adults um, are likely at equal risk, you know, it's not the case that children just do not become infected. Um, but I think the caveat is, is that it requires sufficient opportunities for exposure. And that as has been also mentioned, you know, environmental behavioral factors such as contact patterns are likely major determinants of whether children will be infected. So, you know, opportunities for exposure are a requirement here. Um, so, you know, a lot of people have suggested that studies indicate that children are less likely to be infected than adults. And, you know, we know kids are clearly being missed um, in the testing data. Schools have been closed. As David mentioned, you know, um, NP swabs are challenging to administer in kids, which may also impact the accuracy of the test. Um, and this idea of time ordering of cases in household studies is also challenging um, in many ways. So I think there are a lot of uncertainties here that we um, really would like to, to be able to get some better information about as quickly as possible. So if we go to the next slide, you know, the, the big question where there appears to be even greater uncertainty is about whether or not children transmit their infection to the same degree as adults. And I think there are, you know, certainly examples of children transmitting to both other children and to adults. Um, there is lab data that demonstrates that children have viral loads that are similar to adults. Um, but there are also studies that could be interpreted as support for the hypothesis that children are less likely to transmit compared to adults. Um, and so, you know, it's hard to rule out the fact that children have reduced transmission, have equal transmission, um, and it's really has such important implications for school reopening um, and for trying to think about what that risk potentially looks like as we bring children back into congregate settings where they're going to have um, contacts with other students and all schools, you know, here in Canada, um, schools, um, the Ministry of Education has been talking about much smaller cohorts. Um, you know, these types of questions are very resource intensive um, in terms of, of implementing when we talk about implementing infection prevention and control strategies within school settings. Um, and there are certainly educational and social implications um, for um, what this could mean in terms of disease transmission. And so my last slide um, just talks about, about some of the things that we might want to try to do. And I think one of the previous speakers suggested, you know, we don't need to do this everywhere. Um, but having a, a small number of really well done studies that allow us to look at um, what these, uh, how we can address these questions related to susceptibility to infection and transmission of infection amongst children, especially children of different ages, because that does seem to be quite important, including both PCR and serological samples. Um, you know, I think that there are, um, there is a study that's been planned um, out of the, the Children's Hospital in Barcelona, um, systematic study of settings where test positive, mildly symptomatic children do have opportunities to transmit. And so I believe that they have a study up and running um, in summer camps where they are testing repeatedly longitudinally in time, all of the, the individuals associated with these camps, which I think 
um, will help us to get a better idea of what this potentially looks like. Um, also testing strategies that are easy and quick. So as David said, um, you know, and NP swabs are not um, optimal for trying to do um, sampling in kids. And so better strategies for testing where we can do repeat testing over time in a, a less invasive manner um, certainly would help us a lot um, and doing that over time. And also improved public reporting of school-based outbreaks. And I think this is a real challenge as well. Um, there is a bias, you know, we're relying very heavily on media reports in the absence of other places to get this information. Um, and those are biased towards really large outbreaks. And so um, situations where there are smaller clusters, um, situations where there are no clusters, all of that is really important for us to be able to better assess risk. Um, and that data is very hard to come by right now. So on that note, um, I'm happy to wrap up and pass it over to the next speaker. Thank you so much, Amy, for that fantastic talk. And uh, we'll, we'll circle back and ask Amy questions uh, during the, the, the question period. Uh, so having covered schools, up next is Dr. Christian Altus from the University of Bern in Switzerland. He's the head of the research group in immunoepidemiology at the University of Bern and um, a very creative and incisive epidemiologist who uh, uh, tends to tends to figure things out pretty quickly. Uh, and I, I, I know that from uh, uh, knowing him since, since Ebola days. Uh, so look forward to, to, to hearing what Dr. Altus has to tell us about super spreading events. Turn it over to you, Christian. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, David, for this nice uh, introduction. Um, I got invited uh, to this conference a bit on, on short notice and was asked to present uh, my thoughts and, and insights on super spreading, which is something uh, we have worked on in the past uh, and now also uh, during this pandemic. And I hope to give you a bit of a rough overview that then leads maybe to the panel discussion for uh, further elaboration. Next slide, please. So I'd like to start uh, with uh, this article that maybe some of you uh, have seen from Kai Kupferschmidt, Kai Kupferschmidt, a journalist for Science Magazine, who will join us for the panel discussion uh, pretty much two months ago. I think this was an excellent article summarizing a bit uh, our knowledge and the evidence that we have for super spreading events for uh, coronavirus. So, so that's highly recommended. Shown here a picture, picture from a, a meatpacking plant that uh, at that time uh, had been shown to be amplifiers for, for SARS-CoV-2 uh, transmission uh, and many other events that we've seen or heard of as well from uh, countries around the globe. Um, maybe you remember the super spreading events that uh, have been observed uh, less in schools, certainly, but more in um, singing lessons as well, uh, sport lessons, uh, gyms. Um, so, so that's the evidence uh, that has been collected uh, from different countries. And through some more proper analysis, we, we basically try to understand uh, how we can quantify these uh, effects. Next slide, please. Thank you. So this graph comes uh, from Austria, from the Austrian Agency for Health and Food uh, Safety. They have published quite a nice analysis uh, early on during the outbreak that uh, began in Europe in February and March, April uh, of, of this year. So that's one of the early uh, travel associated transmission clusters in Austria. So with the first case uh, being an import from Italy that went to Austria and then basically initiated a, a transmission chain. So that's data from, from the early days of contact tracing when uh, that was still manageable and then sort of before the lockdown or during probably the first days uh, of the lockdown in Austria. Uh, that's all of the data we are uh, quite interested in uh, when we try to understand the variation uh, in the number of infections that are caused by, by single infected individuals. 
So uh, we see these uh, single cases, single index cases that can uh, infect up to five or 10 people, or maybe more uh, sometimes. But then we also see a lot of dead ends. So people who don't transmit further, uh, that can of course either be uh, due to the fact that uh, the, the secondary infections could not, uh, cannot be found. Um, also because um, strong, non-pharmaceutical interventions like the lockdown uh, started, so there was uh, less opportunity uh, for transmission, but of course these can uh, indeed be individuals that just uh, by chance or by, by the circumstances do not uh, transmit further. And again, we want to understand and quantify uh, basically these properties of transmission. Next slide, please. So that's a slide I did uh, for comparison of to, to, to basically illustrate the variation in the number of secondary cases that can be generated by different types of infectious diseases. And mathematically, we try to quantify that with the uh, so-called over-dispersion parameter K that basically describes the dispersion that we have in a negative binomial uh, distribution. So what we do is we count the number of secondary cases that are infected by index cases. So that can either be zero, one, two, three, five, or more like 10, 20, uh, or even more. So on the right side of this panel, we have the situation for a K value of one, which we often consider as sort of the default scenario or the null hypothesis. So these are infections that uh, typically have quite efficient transmission, smooth transmission chains. So we see here 10 uh, index cases and that the ones in gray, they do transmit further. So these 10 index cases generate 20 secondary cases that corresponds to a, a reproduction number of two. So, so the average number of secondary cases is two. But of course, there is a lot of variation. So we see people infecting one person, three persons, two, uh, and then, then even more. So even in this sort of uh, default scenario, we find that three out of these 10 cases do not transmit further. So about 30% of people uh, would be expected not transmit. So that's quite uh, standard and normal. That's to be expected for typical infectious diseases. And we believe that re roughly reflects the situation for influenza. Then on the very left uh, of this scheme, we see the situation for a K value of 0.1. So the over dispersion parameter is much lower. These are values that are typically found for especially emerging infectious diseases like Ebola. Uh, the first SARS in 2003, but also MERS. And here we see this huge variation in the number of secondary cases where actually the majority of infected individuals do not transmit at all. So in this case, that would be 70%, seven out of 10. Only three uh, person infect, some of them just to two people. But then of course we see these super spreading events where single individuals can uh, transmit to, to many additional uh, people. Then, of course, we have the, the situation uh, in the middle, uh, here described with a K value of 0.5, uh, where we see basically sort of a mix of these two scenarios, sort of smooth transmission, but occasional uh, super spreading events. And in this uh, scenario, we have, let me count, yes, we have five out of uh, 10 individuals who transmit. So that scenario would reflect a situation where for a reproduction number of two, about half of infected individuals transmit further. Next slide, please. So how does this look for uh, SARS coronavirus uh, 2? That's the question we asked quite early on in, in January already, when we actually wanted to estimate the basic reproduction number based on um, the likely outbreak or epidemic trajectory of the outbreak in Wuhan in China. Uh, at the same time, we also try to estimate this over dispersion parameter K in order to quantify the potential for super spreading for this new uh, SARS virus. And that's illustrated in this graph that comes from our paper from Euro surveillance at the end of January. Um, so on the vertical axis, uh, you see the basic reproduction number and you see these likely values. So dark uh, red uh, squares basically indicate a high likelihood where the new coronavirus uh, lies in this two-dimensional plot. So we just see this basic reproduction uh, number of values between two and three. That's uh, what we know uh, or better understand in the meantime. But then on the horizontal axis, we have this over-dispersion parameter, 
where we should focus again on these values between 0.1 and 1. We see on the left-hand side uh, earlier estimates for SARS-2 outbreaks in Beijing and Singapore with quite low values uh, of this dispersion parameter K, also MERS characterized by relatively low values of this over dispersion parameter uh, K with a basic reproduction number that is of course below one because there's no sustained human-to-human uh, -human transmission. Then on the right side, we see estimated values for influenza. Here I have to say that actually these values are not very well understood for arguably many infectious diseases, uh, but also for influenza. So you see that uh, that's actually an estimate that comes from an uh, old contact tracing study that has reanalyzed uh, about a decade ago, I think, uh, from the 1918 uh, pandemic influenza that indicated a uh, dispersion parameter around one. So that's why we typically assume that influenza uh, transmits uh, relatively in smooth transmission chains and quite uh, efficiently with a K value of about one. So the summary from this graph is that while the new coronavirus is compatible with sort of SARS and uh, influenza transmission in terms of super spreading events, it's probably quite likely that it lies somewhere in between. <clears throat> Next slide, please. That's a summary uh, of uh, more studies uh, that looked at this value and tried to estimate it. So the first study, as I've mentioned, uh, from our group at the University of Bern, uh, where we estimated uh, this k-value at about 0.5. Uh, of course, we, with quite a large confidence interval, so we didn't want to go uh, too much into that at that moment, but um, with uh, the publication of newer studies, actually, it looks like this value was probably quite spot on. So two additional studies that have been published, one in Lancet Infectious Disease, one uh, I think still uh, only available as a preprint from the research group of Gabriel Leung in, in Hong Kong. They estimate uh, similar values at 0 0.6, 0 0.4, 0 0.5. These two studies are based on contact tracing data, so where basically people count the number of secondary infections that uh, index cases generate. And then also worth mentioning the last study uh, by uh, people from the London School uh, of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, uh, that's a bit an outlier. They estimated quite a low value for this over dispersion parameter, so which would be more similar to what we've observed for MERS, SARS, and Ebola. Uh, I don't think that uh, this is, uh, we can uh, exclude this possibility. So we've certainly seen these enormous super spreading events, uh, but probably the, the, the value is a bit low to describe uh, the level of super spreading in a general population. Uh, that is to be expected. So that's sort of the evidence uh, that we have. Next slide, please. And that would probably indicate that we are in roughly in this middle scenario where we have to expect that about uh, half of infected individuals do transmit further. We have quite uh, efficient and steady transmission and occasional uh, super spreading events that we have to deal with, but that also provide sort of an opportunity for efficient control interventions. Next slide. So what does that mean, the level of super spreading for uh, outbreak risks, risks in new countries or new areas after cases have been introduced? Uh, that was uh, uh, a topic that received quite a bit of attention early on during the outbreak, basically before the first outbreaks uh, occurred in Europe. And uh, this graph comes from a nice study from Adam Kucharski and colleagues from the London School that was published quite early on in Lancet Infectious Diseases. So in the top panel, they look uh, how this um, extent of heterogeneity in transmission, uh, or they call it homogeneity, um, but that basically reflects uh, this over dispersion parameter K, uh, affects the probability of a large outbreak. So if an infectious disease is characterized by a high level of super spreading, that would be indicated on the left, like uh, as it has been observed for SARS or MERS, then the probability that a single case causes a large outbreak uh, is quite low because it's very likely that actually the single case would not transmit further. Uh, but the less uh, super spreading we have or the higher these values of K, the more likely it is that actually even single introduction of cases would result uh, in large outbreaks. 
And that's shown on the bottom panel here, I think for values that are reminiscent of, of SARS from, from, from 2003. So where we see the accumulation of introductions, for example, in, in new countries uh, such as Europe, uh, where we see that after five to 10 introductions of cases that uh, go undetected uh, and undiagnosed, the probability increases substantially that this will lead to a large outbreak. Next slide, please. We also looked uh, a bit at uh, the effects of uh, control interventions, depending on, on the level of superspreading that is expected for SARS-CoV-2 transmission. So these results are based on actually quite a, a simple uh, modeling exercise where we ask the question, what will be the effect of uh, cutting off certain uh, levels of spreading by reducing the maximal group sizes that are allowed for a population. So assuming that the super spreading events happen uh, at a single event where a lot of people gather together. So for example, uh, an event where 200 people attend and then there could be a super spreading event uh, of, of 200 people. So what happens if we don't allow uh, these uh, events or group sizes and reduce the group size in order to prevent the super spreading events from happening? So here we see on the top left panel the situation for a basic reproduction number of 2.2, which is what is roughly expected uh, for SARS coronavirus uh, 2. And then on the horizontal axis, we have this dispersion parameter k from values of 0.1 to 1. And the lines indicate different maximal group sizes that are allowed. So we see if we cap off uh, basically the group sizes at 100, that uh, there we wouldn't expect uh, a huge effect uh, on transmission, basically, because basically most of these super spreading events happen with 20, 30, 50, 60, 70 people. So that's still possible. But then, of course, if we have drastic measures like maximum group sizes of five people uh, that were implemented in at least some European countries, we see quite a drastic effect uh, just from this single non pharmaceutical intervention alone. So actually uh, capping off group sizes uh, can be uh, at least for certain situations be quite an efficient way to reduce uh, the reproduction number of SARS-CoV-2. <clears throat> Chris, Christian, I, I don't want to cut off this excellent uh, talk, but I, I, uh, I know we're, we're getting into panel discussion time and I want people to have the ability to really uh, uh, talk about some of these ideas. So I'll turn it back over to you, but ask you to, to wrap. Sure, I just have the, the last slide, thanks. Okay, thank you. Okay, yeah, with that, uh, I basically want to bring up some open issues that we could discuss uh, in the panel discussion as well. So it's still a bit unclear what are the contributions of uh, individual environment and activity for this uh, SARS-CoV-2 super spreading events. Of course, uh, they all contribute. We've discussed about them a bit uh, before, but there are still open issues. Also, the importance of aerosol transmission in what situations is most transmission due to aerosol transmission and how does this differ in other settings? Um, what are these critical thresholds for event sizes related to the, the slide I've shown you before? So uh, if there is basically um, the situation where we need uh, to reduce transmission, is it advisable to limit group sizes again? And then uh, as a last question is also the feasibility of contact tracing for large events. So once large events are allowed or allowed again, uh, how uh, is it feasible to uh, basically conduct contact tracing for such events? And maybe with the last slide. Next slide, please. I just want to thank two funders, uh, which is one uh, research project from European Union's Horizon 2022. Uh, research innovation program and one from the Swiss National Science Foundation. And with that, I want to give over to you, David, for the panel discussion. Thanks. Thank you both, both to you and Amy for excellent uh, talks. I know we don't have a lot of time. Um, uh, perhaps I, I meant to lead off with the first question, so perhaps I'll throw it over to the panel. But Dale, I'm particularly interested in your response as someone in Singapore where the community component to the outbreak seems to have been very limited relative to the super spreading dormitory component. Are there super spreading people or are there only super spreading settings and environments? Uh, what do each of you have to say about that? <laughs> 
Perhaps let's we'll, uh, start with you, Christian. Thanks, David. Uh, this is a very good question. And uh, I think as Maria also mentioned, uh, I think we really have to, to emphasize that it's important about to, to talk about super spreading events and not super spreaders or super spreader events, which is a term that uh, seems to have been invented in Switzerland <laughs> in, the, in the last weeks. Um, so of course, um, the individual, the environment and also the activity uh, contribute uh, to this uh, large number of transmission. But I think the focus should really be on the environment, okay. and the activity and the concepts of individual and much less uh, on the individual itself. Amy, what's your take on this? Yeah, I, I agree with Christian. I think that, um, you know, for me, it's, it's a case of setting likely and, and collecting better data on what those settings look like to be able to identify common commonalities would be very helpful from a, from a policy perspective, recognizing that many countries are, are in various states of reopening. If we can identify where the greatest risk lies, that can help us a lot because I think prioritizing um, settings for um, sustained interventions, which will allow us to be able to open other types of congregate settings like schools would be really helpful. Dale, what, what is your take on this in, in, from a Singapore perspective? Oh, thanks, David. Um, I'm not sure it's a Singapore perspective. I think, uh, as everyone else is saying, um, it, it's a super spreading event is, is an outcome of, of, of lots of things. It's, uh, it's the person being in, infectious or in the right stage of, of infectiousness, uh, probably having good enough symptoms uh, and being in a crowded environment for a prolonged period of time with poor ventilation. That should uh, just about wrap it up. <laughs> okay. Uh, Mugay, what, what, would your, what would your take be? Yeah, I mean, um, me and my uh, colleagues and our team have reviewed a couple of um, super spreading events, trying to come up with an understanding. So I, I agree that there are different dimensions and definitely environment is important, but also, for example, time spent together. Uh, I think the patient characteristics is also important because, you know, we've seen a lot of outbreaks in long term care facilities. And what we know is that uh, patients are potentially, you know, seeding a lot of virus at the time of developing symptoms or just before symptoms. So those people are already in the facility. So that may be, you know, driving a lot of infection. And also like activity is important. What we're seeing is, for example, dining together or sleeping together, you know, uh, various different activities, singing. Uh, singing. <laughs> can also, you know, bring different dimensions to the risk. The most marvelous recent piece of public health guidance I've seen in Japan was you can go to the amusement park and ride a roller coaster, but you must not scream. <laughs> Which seems like the, Japan would be the only country where people would actually be able to comply with that, I think. Uh, Kai, you've, 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 oh, sorry. Um, on our... Uh, train system, our commuter train system. Uh, it's wear masks and don't talk and really? don't, even, don't even talk on the phone. You're not allowed to talk on the MRT. So, that, so that's beyond Japan. This is, this is a more widespread uh, uh, guidance. I didn't know that. Kai, what, what, what would, you, what would your, your perspective be? You've, you've written a lot of very smart stuff about super spreading. Thanks, David. I mean, I, I think I, you know, mostly agree with what's been said. I mean, the one point I would add, I mean, specifically, if you look at Singapore, I mean, you know, we do know that there are vulnerable populations, basically blind spots. Um, and when all of these, you know, things were, I mean, when people were doing these public health interventions, I think in a lot of these places, they kind of overlooked some places. And I think some of the super spreading events that we've seen in the last months, we can really put down to that. I mean, it's, you know, this is something that we could have done better and we should have done better, I think. So, so that's a very, a very specific thing. And, and Singapore with the migrant workers um, and the dormitories, I think, is, is an example of that as far as I can tell. I, I don't know the situation in Singapore um, well enough. Um, I mean, the other thing I would just say is, you know, um, I mean, the difficulty as a journalist with all of this, of course, I mean, it wasn't discussed much in the beginning. And, 
you know, there is always this question, um, what does it mean in terms of how people should behave? And for me, it's been very difficult. I mean, after I wrote that piece, I really wanted to write a, a follow-up piece saying, okay, so now what, you know, what does this mean? How do we need to change what we do? Right. And what does it mean for the individual? And it turns out we, you know, we don't really know it that well. I mean, you can make a case, for instance, that you could shape your communication to the public around it in a way where, you know, if you go to one of these events, the risk for you of being infected is always, you know, either you get infected or you don't. I mean, the outcome, you know, and a lot of people really want to go to some of these places, um, you know, have these big events. I mean, I'm a gay man in Berlin, you know, I, I, can, I can see, you know, around me, the people kind of um, starting to, to make, to do parties that are illegal because they really want to do this. But if you shape your, your public health message around it, you can also say, you know, not just, the question isn't just whether you get infected, but, you know, if you're going to infect other people, you know, are you going to be responsible for, you know, potentially a really large outbreak? This is when I read the, the case reports, like the one from the church and, uh, sorry, from the, the choir practice in Washington or from the, that wedding in Jordan. I mean, I, I think about these people, you know, who went there and unwittingly, you know, infected a lot of people. So, so I think there's something there, but I find it very hard to, to strike the balance here. I think that's very astute. Uh, I, 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 I have a comment, but I'm going to save it because I want to get to Greg. And Greg, I, I hope you're not offended by my saving you for last, but this sort of seems to have led very naturally up to the question when we talk about dormitories and migrant workers and the links between work and super spreading, we're really getting into territory around public health and human rights. And mm -hmm. I, I wonder, um, I, I, I wonder what your thoughts are on, on issues around disparities in health, socioeconomic right. disadvantage and, and super spreading. So nobody brought up the word prison over the past hour and a half. Wow. Um, they're the site of the 10 largest clusters of COVID-19 to date in the US, more than a thousand cases reported in each. There's little incentive to improve conditions or address the epidemic in these settings. I've been involved with court proceedings over the past three, four months. Uh, about trying to get individual prisoners out. When you read these depositions, they show an unsanitary environments, limited testing, difficulties in social distancing, scarcity of PPE. Prisoners are often less healthy than the general population, and at least the U.S. population in prisons is aging, and the data is sparse in these settings, right? These are institutional sites for super spreading, and um, we, we just basically don't discuss them, and they don't get research because it's hard to do. The other thing is that people are experiencing homelessness, people use drugs. Um, we talk about needing to, to, to message to people, but if you don't have a place to live, the question about how you're gonna deal with sort of public health messaging in the context of people experiencing homelessness, people use drugs, is gonna be an issue. And so um, unless we deal with transmission in these vulnerable groups, prisoners, people experiencing homelessness, people use drugs, sex workers, we're basically gonna have a reservoir of individuals who will be um, always uh, uh, at high risk for transmission and for transmission on, uh, for acquiring the virus and transmitting it onward. So um, the main thing I'd love for people on this call to put their minds together to think about what to do with prisons. We know it's not just the US phenomenon. We know from our work in TB that TB spreads across prisons when, when, when TB gets into it and what happens in prisons gets out into the community, right? Look at the genotypes of, of TB in prisons and outside of prisons in Brazil, in Moldova and other places. Um, you don't contain the virus within the prison walls. So big pitch for work in prisons and trying to figure out how to deal with it because it's where the 10 biggest super spreading events have been in the United States. Um, I'm going to follow that up. I, I'm not sure when they're going to pull the plug on this, this discussion. I'm just watching the, the text box uh, to see when we, when we have to end. But I've had a question uh, in the text box from, from Marion, which is <laughs> also a bone of contention locally. It's you epidemiologists say we should test and test and test and test, but you, 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 you folks don't really understand that testing is a finite resource. How do we prioritize the use of testing? What, I, what I've been thinking locally in terms of Canada is, is we focus as much as we can on um, catching asymptomatic infections going into co congregate settings, the sorts of places we've been discussing, workplaces, prisons, um, uh, long-term care. I'm curious what the panel uh, uh, would have to say about that. If we have a test budget, to what extent do we allocate it for clinical illness? Should we be testing 20-year-olds with sore throats 
or should we be should we be focused very much on on uh, entry screening for congregate settings? Uh, I'm not sure if anyone wants to take a stab stab at that. I'll throw that out to you, Dale. Uh, if you have any thoughts, my microphone. Sorry, uh, mute. It, it has to be tailored. Um, it depends whether you're really trying to, to to stop transmission or whether you're trying to to protect the older ones. Certainly, in our in our dorm outbreak in in Singapore, um, the the scale was enormous. It, it's still going on. It's it's been going on for three months in terms of super spreading events and. When the serology is released, you're going to see that there was a lot more people than were diagnosed. Um, but a lot of the strategy was involved getting anyone over 45 out, um, and, and maybe that could be a prison strategy as well. You know, it's it's it, you, you've got to you, you have to be strategic, um, and I think that's a large portion. Australia, uh, Singapore's got a very low mortality, and I think that's in no small part to the fact that despite these huge numbers, we put anyone over 45 years old in, um, in five-star hotels, basically. Interesting. Can we, can we sort of transition from that? I'll ask one last question in view of the time, but I, I think I might throw this to, to, to Amy and to Greg, because I know they've both been interested in this. Go, and go from, from prison environments for disadvantaged folks to sort of prisons for highly advantaged folks. Any thoughts on university dormitories and university reopening? Uh, Amy, what are your thoughts on, on how we keep dormitories safe at university campuses? Yeah, so that's been a, a big question across all campuses and, and here on our campus, I know that I early on expressed strong concern about the risks of filling, filling our dorms to capacity, um, including, you know, double, you know, dorm, rooming with roommates and all this sort of stuff, which, which initially was the original thought. Um, some settings, especially in the US, have talked a lot about testing quite extensively in that setting. In Canada, that has not gained the same traction that it seems to in the US. And so, um, I mean, for me, I, I see it as a big risk. Every university seems to have adopted a somewhat different strategy or way they're going to manage it. Um, here at Guelph, we have opened the dorms only to students who, who essentially have nowhere else to go, um, which will keep us at, at quite low capacity. Um, which hopefully will be beneficial in terms of mitigating risk in, in that sort of congregate setting. Because I do think, you know, all, all the infection prevention and control we can try in that setting is, is probably going to be problematic if we fill it to capacity. Greg, Greg what are your thoughts from a, from a country that has a bit more access to, to testing for campuses than, than we do here in Canada? Oh, we don't actually test very many people in the U.S. Um, but um, remember, we have sort of fulminant outbreaks in Half a, I mean, two dozen states in the U.S., Florida, Texas, right. Arizona. I don't see how you can open up universities in, the, in those contexts. We have talked a lot about testing. Uh, David Peltiel here and Rochelle Walensky up at Harvard have talked about testing twice a week, everybody on the campus. I think it's going to be a logistical problem for Yale and for everybody else. But these are young people, uh, and we're expecting them also to be able to social distance, to wear masks, and do all these things that risk-taking 20-year-olds do. Um, and right. so... Uh, it's up to university administrators and people uh, uh, who have some control over the environment to set protocols and to make opening decisions uh, and not lie all the blame on what students are gonna be able to do or not do uh, when they get to campus. So I, I, I'm not a big fan of opening up this fall. Um, I think we're just gonna see outbreaks in September and October that are gonna set uh, chaos in motion on many campuses in the US. Could I ask? Kai and Christian, if either of you have any final words uh, to add to this discussion, I think, unfortunately, we have to end. I, I feel like we could probably go for another hour. Kai? Well, we really just, I mean, the, the thing that struck me when I wrote the article was how few, you know, good, really good contact tracing studies we had early on of super spreading events. I think there was a window of opportunity early on before contact tracing was completely overwhelmed. And I think that was missed. So I really hope that we can understand it a lot better now. One of the things that I'm really, you know, still curious about and trying to understand is since we're talking about stuff that's based on behavior, that's based on, on setting, uh, 
Um, this is so different from country to country. That's something I've learned in the last 10 years in my job is that it's not the pathogen, it's, it's you know, human behavior, it's society. And so, you know, really we need for all these different countries and settings and cultures, we, we need really good data on what is, how it is spreading there and not just take, you know, what Japan is doing and say, if we do this, you know, it works right. here. Fair enough. I'm, I'm chastened. Christian, last, last short word to you. Yes, uh, I can only underline well, what Kai just said, that uh, I think globally we sort of missed the opportunity to study this phenomenon uh, due to the various lockdowns that we had. And I think now it's very critical that uh, through contact tracing in different uh, countries and settings and populations to really gather this uh, data carefully, uh, really understand where transmission is ha happening and then really make uh, local recommendations for, for response. And I think that's very critical for all countries now. It, it, it's with great regret that I'm going to end our panel discussion because I want to keep talking about this. But um, it, we have some excellent additional uh, talks coming. So I'm going to turn the, the, the microphone back over to my co-chair, Dr. Koopmans, and uh, I will mute myself and... Thank you, because you are eating into my time. So I know, I know, I'm and I, I don't want to, uh, <laughs> yeah, bye-bye. No, but an excellent discussion. I think uh, the, uh, so uh, in, in listening to the discussions, I think what is important is to uh, go back to the question on what uh, research gaps do we see? It would also be great if all the different panelists keep thinking about that and send us their input. So, but, but for sure, very detailed, meticulous outbreak investigations that include the building scientists, that include genomics, uh, that include serology to really unravel some of these situations seems uh, critical. So in this last uh, uh, session, um, we are focusing on uh, well, it's titled Non-Pharmaceutical Interventions, but it is trying to get at some of this uh, innovative ways of uh, interfering and understanding uh, information flow, for instance. So we will start off with two short uh, talks. The first one from uh, Daniel, uh, Daniel uh, Ramondini, who is a, a professor of physics, if I'm correct, Daniel? Yes, exactly. Uh, yeah, it's from the University of Bologna and who has been working on the infodemic uh, element and particularly also trying to understand how um, the uh, infodemic may hinder actually uh, proper uh, uh, public health interventions. Over to you, Daniel. Okay, so, uh, well, uh, I have to thank uh, the organizer for inviting me I'm not an epidemiologist, I am a physicist, so I'm much more involved in data analysis with rather, I say, basic knowledge on uh, epi epidemiology. So please, with the next slide, uh, just a quick introduction. Uh, we come uh, within this uh, project, VIO, which is on uh, detecting and monitoring epidemic spreading. I am involved in the modeling work package because I'm more into data analysis. And we are trying to apply tools from machine learning, bioinformatics, and network theory to these topics. In particular, in collaboration with another partner of VIO, which is Professor Marcel Salate from EPFL, we started, due to the events surrounding us, to deal with data extracted from the Twitter social network. Uh, please, with the next uh, slide. So what we did was to collect tweets associated to coronavirus through selected keywords in English language in the period from January to May. And uh, what we got was about 27, uh, uh, 270 million of tweets that were mapped into a network of about 23 million users and 176 million links that correspond to retweets of uh, tweets between users. What we observed was uh, a really, let's say, unfair distribution with uh, less than 0.1% of users 
uh, collecting almost 80% of the retweets. So we can surely talk about uh, relevant influencers, as they speak in jargon, with a relevant role in diffusing information, opinions, but also feelings about uh, COVID. Next slide, please. Uh, no, oh, okay, yes. So we characterize first within this network the global structure of the communities. So there are subgroups. We identified the 15 large communities enrolling 98% of the users in the network that can be uh, quite clearly associated to specific countries. For example, in the plot on the top right, we see the community that we call number B in which a large part of the tweets come from US users, but through machine learning algorithms, looking at the words within the tweets, we could also classify the users if they were mainly diffusing a political message related to sport, but also to sex or to religion. So we could characterize the population and an ecology of these uh, communities. Some of this could also quite clearly associated to the diffusion of fake or plot related messages. Some of these users, for example, were blocked by Twitter himself because of their uh, uh, messages that were not allowed by Twitter communities. Next slide, please. Here we see the we also characterize the evolution of this community over time, splitting the Twitter course of messages within months. So we collected, we built four networks regarding January and February, March, April, and May, that somehow can also represent the early, the peak, and the late phases of the first wave of coronavirus epidemics around the world, because here we are talking about the worldwide network. What we see in the colored plot in the middle is that the number of users grows from an early phase in January, May, and it decays a little bit uh, in April and uh, May. So possibly this can also be a proxy about the concern on uh, COVID uh, around the world because the number of people talking about it changes over time. From a network point of view, what we saw was that these communities are quite stable over time. So most of the users belong to the same communities along the different months. So probably we suppose that this community can also go beyond the COVID topics and maybe they are gathered in communities that could share different political opinions or some plot believings. So maybe these groups uh, that can uh, discuss about these public health topics maybe belong to a larger class of users with similar ideas. On the right plot, we also performed a measure about the ratio of links between users of different communities and within the same community. And what we saw was an increase in segregation. So users are reducing the retweet between different communities. And possibly this is not good in terms of the health of the ecological system of this Twitter network, because when communities try to uh, segregate more, Typically, they just amplify their own opinion, and this can also be a possible negative aspect because there is no exchange of opinions with people with different ideas. And this segregation is very typical of social network in which also algorithms tend to uh, segregate people or aggregating people with similar interests and opinions because the number of likes and retweets tend to increase, and this is advantageous. Daniel? Yeah. Daniel, uh, can you... Yeah, this is the last, uh, the last slide, please, and I'm finished. So what we are planning to do, we are planning to characterize uh, the tweets through sentiment analysis to measure the social concern about specific topics, like using protective measures, the risk, vaccination, 
and we try to monitor these infodemics uh, also because maybe some possible intervention could be thought uh, like uh, to favor the intercommunication or to identify fake news and messages and probably counteract uh, with some specific spreading of more reliable information. Moreover, of course, this analysis could be done also at the country uh, level using, uh, in that case, specific languages. Okay, so that's it. I acknowledge the VO European project that allowed uh, the, the, the beginning of this uh, analysis and this joint work with many really valuable partners. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, uh, Daniel. Um, and uh, of course, I know your work and I'm always impressed by it. But a very uh, also new field uh, that we need to uh, start to understand. Okay, so the next uh, uh, introduce, introduction is by uh, Dr. Brian Kim, the team lead epidemiologist at the Korea Center for Disease Control and Prevention. Uh, focusing on uh, infectious diseases and medical informatics. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, all right. So uh, thanks for inviting me for this workshop and uh, this conference. And uh, I'd like to present about our contact tracing experiences in Korea. And next slide, please. And before I start explaining about our contact tracing measures, I would like to just highlight the overall situation of COVID-19 in, in Korea. As of 15th July, we now have 13, more than 13,000 confirmed cases and 289 deaths. And the number of laboratory tests is, is actually more than 1.4 million laboratory tests was, has been conducted. And Still, nowadays, the overall situation has, is a quite stabilized, but still, we've been, we've been conducting testing around 20,000 tests per day. Next slide, please. And this slide shows overall progress of our response measures along with the EPI curve. And uh, as you can see, our national crisis management level and our social distancing measures and also entry screenings for incoming travelers have been continuously updated based on the evolving situations. And actually, and this orange bar shows the community level transmission, community cases in community, community level. And that this blue bar shows the imported cases from overseas. Next slide, please. Uh, this pie chart shows the main route of transmission for the recent two weeks. And about half of the, of the newly confirmed were actually imported from other countries. And one third is up from local clusters and 8% from contact of confirmed cases. And around 8% are still under investigation. And these trends is quite, has been quite consistent over the past couple of months as we are now getting into more stabilized situations. Next slide, please. Our contact tracing is uh, incorporated with uh, case investigation and uh, risk assessment that is currently being done in the, in the field. And of course, we, we use conventional, I mean, conventional approaches like uh, interview with, conducting interview with the case physician and family members, as, as this is the, the most important way to get information. But, this is not always enough to find us to find all contact. And as you already might have heard, we also use GPS location of the confirmed cases and the credit card usage record. And, and also CCTV is also the record of CCTV of the confirmed cases are actually systematically collected along, along with uh, other implementing other prevention measures. And once we identify the location of those confirmed cases, we visit those places to check the closest CCTV record and to, to find the additional contact. Through this, I mean, multilateral approaches, approaches, we were somehow able to find all contact of the confirmed cases. And uh, we initially classified contact into two, actually close or casual, but I mean, because as we are, as the number of 
actual context has expanded quite significantly. So we are just using home quarantine measure regardless of their level of exposures. Next, next slide, please. And we are actually developing epidemic investigation support system, which is now called EISS. And uh, through the collaboration with the other ministries, what we are trying to do here is that we are trying to automate information gathering processes along throughout uh, epidemic investigation and contact tracings. And uh, we are also hoping to integrate analysis module into this program to support quick decision making as well as, as, well as to provide more systematic geographic information. And this system, this system is still, still under development and uh, still has a very long way to go in terms of uh, until we until until the use in the real response next slide please and this slide shows what we found in the itaewon nightclub outbreak and as you can see we identified seventh generation of virus spread in relatively short period of time which is about a month and uh, as you, and as you can see in these examples, we were somehow able to find this, I mean, generations of outbreak in, in one big huge outbreaks. Next slide, please. And as we are discussing super spread event and potential way of transmission of COVID-19 today, I actually added a couple of slides and we found some confirmed cases who were infected while, while they were out of two meters range, physical distance from the confirmed cases. And this is the map of a singing room and the red star is the index case here. And we found another two cases from other room, which is number eight, and which is a bit distant from the room of the index cases. Based on our case investigations, there were, they did not know each other and that they, there was no kind of physical contact between them. So, I mean, th this is one of the examples that we we found that, I mean, droplet, droplet transmission is cannot fully explain the whole transmission of COVID-19. And next slide, please. Can and you this come, is the can you come to a close? Okay. Yeah, yes, this is the last slide. Yes, and this is the last slide and these are actual cases and uh, as other presenters and panelists already have mentioned, I mean, this super spreading event is relatively common in closed, especially in closed, crowded and closed contact settings. And as you can see, I mean, just single, ca single case can lead to huge number of, I mean, other secondary and tertiary transmissions and sporadic outbreaks. So finding contact in in very rapid timely manner is always a uh, key issues in containing this spread of this virus and uh, so this is this one slide is one of the good example of the showing that i mean covid-19 the highly transmissible characteristic of the covid-19 and uh, and so yeah that's next slide please yeah that's the end of my presentation and thank you for your time. Okay, and thank you for your uh, presentation. Um, we all have been following the, the successful uh, tracing of cases in Korea with, uh, I think with some envy here and there, but we will discuss it. Uh, our uh, final speaker is uh, uh, Dr. Charles Haas. Uh, he was introduced, uh, uh, Chuck Haas, yeah, well, both. Um, uh, it was introduced before, so please go ahead. Thank you, and thank you for um, the invitation. Next slide, please. So what I want to introduce to you is a different way of looking at the disease transmission process, uh, which I think is complementary to epidemiology, medical, and social science lenses, and that's the lens of um, engineering and risk assessment. And I think all the approaches, as was stated earlier, really need to work together. Next slide. So the, the way in which um, I approach a problem such as this is think about the trans, uh, 
at the pathway from initial source of the infection, in this case, a infected individual, whether symptomatic, asymptomatic, or presymptomatic, fate and transport of the emitted um, pathogens in the environment, getting an estimate of exposure to a receptor, another individual who might be susceptible, and then looking at the probability of an adverse outcome or a secondary infection from that exposure. Next slide. Now, what I want to walk you through is what we know and what we know, don't know about each one of those particular components. We certainly have a sense that respiratory ejecta can behave as a source. We have data from other viruses, principally influenza, but also um, other viruses on their emission and general information on the emission of aerosols and droplets from other activities. What we don't know for SARS-CoV-2 is the size resolved emission rate under different circumstances, such as vocalization, breathing, sneezing, and coughing, and individuals at different stages in the process, whether it's asymptomatic, presymptomatic, or cases at different stages. Next slide. Fate and transport, we have a good sense of how particles in air behave in different circulation conditions physically. We don't have an understanding of the specific decay rates of SARS-CoV-2, or I should say a complete understanding. There's some basic data that has been collected, but specific day rate, decay rate behavior as a function of temperature, humidity, and within different suspending body fluids, which may modulate decay rate in the environment. Next slide. In terms of the receptor, we certainly know respiration rate and volume for various populations in various um, activity patterns. What we don't have an understanding on are critical compartments for the initial infection or the in vivo uh, processes from a um, kinetic point of view. However, we do know potentially what deposition rates on mucous membranes might be, as well as the inhalation volume. Next slide. On the health effects side, there's a long history of microbial dose response modeling that has been used for many organisms, including for uh, SARS-1, as well as influenza. We do have evidence that animal models can provide predictive value for estimating human health effects, and we do have dose response models for other coronaviruses. The unknowns, of course, we don't have specific dose response models for SARS-CoV-2, although as was stated uh, earlier, animal model work is in development, and hopefully some of that data will provide knowledge for informing refined dose response models. We also don't know um, whether or not existing dose response models corroborate what has been observed with attack rates in epidemiological investigations. Next slide. So I'll put you back in time, Marion, um, finishing with um, some of my generic funding for microbial risk assessment work. I think there's a lot of opportunity for microbial risk assessors and people with an engineering mindset to collaborate with the epidemiologists and the microbiologists going forward to help understand the entire picture of this elephant that we're faced with. Thank you. Okay, wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, I thought when you said you put me back into time, you were going to talk about SARS, because in that epidemic, there, there really was some engineering involved because yes. of the uh, Amoy Garden situation, and there was quite heavy uh, uh, input from the engineering world there. And we did, we have in the paper that we published on the original SARS, we did use the Amoy Gardens um, outbreak to help do a plausibility check on our dose response modeling. Hmm. Okay, great. <laughs> um, so thank you. So uh, we are uh, opening the discussion now. So we have two additional panelists. 
The first one is Ben Cowling, who joined us from Hong Kong uh, University, who is the head of the Division of Epidemiology and Biostatistics uh, at the University of Hong Kong and has been very active from early on, also trying to bring out hypotheses that needed testing while this uh, epidemic uh, was uh, evolving. And the second is Dr. Patricia Kingori from the University of Oxford, who is an associate professor in global health ethics uh, and also clearly a critical field here. So um, to open up the discussion, uh, maybe I can start with a question to uh, uh, Brian Kim. Um, in your, can you, can the panelists please switch on their videos? Um, I like to see some faces. <laughs> um, and my first question is, in your example, can you uh, indicate what proportion of cases came, uh, did you track from the, let's say, the more traditional epidemiological investigation and what proportion could you track by the add-on from the CCTV, from the credit card tracking, and uh, from the GPS tracking? Uh, thanks for your question. And actually, and actually, we are always using uh, using both the traditional approaches and also using these additional information sources using other credit card usage and CCTV. And so we don't, I mean, we don't actually, we cannot differentiate between the, I mean, the number of cases that we could found, we could found with just traditional approaches and also the number of additional contact that we could found with other additional approaches. But because, I mean, field response is always dynamic and is quite always hectic. So we don't, we don't actually we don't have that kind of time to systematically differentiate between the use of those two different information sources yeah that's yeah that's what i can say at this point yes okay so maybe uh, a question for uh, patricia kingori um it was the use of uh, tracking uh, in different ways, shapes, and forms has triggered quite a bit of discussion. Uh, I wonder if you would want to comment there. But it, it is clear that it has uh, benefits if you think about uh, understanding where this virus is moving, uh, but there's also an in a culturally different um, barriers to their use. Um, can you comment or share your views on that? Thanks very much for inviting me and thanks also for the excellent panelists. I've learned a lot also from being part of the, this uh, meeting. Um, I think the idea of tracking is really important and it's also one of those issues that really highlights the value of having not only ethicists but social scientists embedded in these projects from the very beginning. Um, what we know about the use of things like mobile phones um, tracking is that when we look at them in different contexts, they look very different. So in particular, um, drawing attention to Susan Erickson's work, who did some work um, in uh, Sierra Leone, looking at the tracking and tracing um, in Ebola. And what she found was that people use their phones very differently. So in one particular context, you might imagine one person owning a phone and so that phone is used, can be used to track and trace that person. Whereas in other contexts, people have multiple SIMs, share phones, phones are used very differently. And so that's a really valuable insight that we can get from social scientists, the ways in which phones um, as a mechanism to detect or trace can look very differently in different contexts. So that's on the social science aspect. And then when we start to look at some of the ethics, again, if these uh, ideas are embedded and the collaborations include ethicists from the beginning, we start to look at things uh, very differently. So something that looks like a completely um, ethical approach can be very um, unethical in different contexts and involving breaches in people's privacy. So I think that what we, um, what I'm advocating here um, is that, you know, uh, that different disciplines are involved in conversation very early on because some of these interventions can't necessarily travel across different contexts in the same way. 
So maybe a follow-up question uh, from me, because in, I think this is part of our challenge, isn't it? So we've heard that now also with uh, outbreaks, super spreading events are so different, so situational. Uh, and how you can really understand what is going on is so local uh, and requires local knowledge, uh, local ethical context and so on. Is it even possible to come up with like generic research questions that that really would help us, you know, make big steps forward that would work in all these different contexts? Is that even possible or should we just be saying funders, please just fund the basic public health work <laughs> with all it takes? Uh, and that's uh, one of the key components. Over to you, Patricia. Well, that's a big question. <laughs> um, I think, you know, my experience certainly working as part of the National Council of Bioethics, um, and we did a report that came out earlier this year, which was examining um, global health emergencies. One of the things we found was that people really want to be able to have something that works locally for them. And most people want to have buy in and a say in what these research and interventions look like. So whether they're generic, whether they're public health, they want to feel that this is something that can work in their context. And that's really important. So something devised in the UK to be implemented in Belgium <laughs> won't work. If the people of, um, if, if people in Belgium don't feel that it's, 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 it's for them. So that's really important. Okay, thank you. Ben, maybe um, you uh, would like to weigh in here. Or feel free to comment on any of the things that you've heard. I think contact tracing helps a lot. We've seen the presentation from Korea, also our experience in Hong Kong, that contact tracing is really useful to get ahead of the virus. And it's a more efficient way to intervene for public health authorities than mass social distancing, even to the extent of lockdowns. But right now, Hong Kong's having a second wave of infections. We have uh, 100 cases yesterday, is 70 today, after a long period of time without any. And I think in the last week or so, there's been hundreds of, you know, a few hundred cases already. And, and it's going to go on for another month. That's in spite of everybody here wearing face masks outdoors, in public areas, in public transport, uh, basically universal masking. And it's also in spite of doing test and trace. So I, I think they're both really important things. I think test and trace is really, really valuable. But at the same time, we can't hope to stop the other public health measures uh, when we ramp up testing and, and contact tracing and quarantine and so on. Uh, that, that's my observation from Hong Kong right now. So I guess one of the questions throughout would be is 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 it possible to get more bang for the buck by using for instance the the information that david talked about and that you of course also work work on mm. um can, and can we learn that maybe from pre sort of tracking people's behavior so that it immediately is there the moment they are diagnosed and say okay this is a high risk yeah, if, if it's possible. I think the, the, the other important thing to note about super spreading, I think super spreading is the universal phenomenon. It just hasn't been recognized in many parts of the world. I think it's going on everywhere. And what that means is for contact tracing, you can get ahead of the virus by looking to see who might have been affected by a case. But you can also look the other direction and find these super spreading events that maybe you weren't aware of. You can link together separate groups of clusters, separate groups of cases and look for the common factors, the super spreading events. And then from doing that, go forwards again to find lots of other cases that you might never have been able to recognize until you associated them with a super spreading event. And that's been useful in Hong Kong. I know it's been useful in Japan uh, and could well be a, an important thing elsewhere. So I guess this has been um, striking. I'm a bit of a one health person, but this is a veterinary way of thinking. So in, for instance, in uh, farm outbreaks, uh, uh, then the, the contact patterns between farms are looked at to understand which farm is next uh, in, the, in the investigations. So given all the sort of the barriers to, to uh, in terms of privacy, do you think that with some of the new tools and, and, and science that would be possible in a more or less 
safe way, um, let me let me put that question before Daniel. Would it be possible to use the the insights that you, for instance, get from social media to have a warning uh, or, or more a, a, an idea of the network of dispersal? Uh, sorry, I was answering to, to another question about the difference of local and global influencers. Of course, our analysis was uh, global because we were using English language. So it is also hard uh, to characterize the timing of the messages because, of course, we have different uh, uh, countries all over the 24 hours in the world. So an exact mapping between events and the response on the Twitter network is not so easy. I think it is possible to reply the same analysis at a local level. For example, we are doing it with Italian language related to Italy. In that case, you could try also to correlate also in time crucial events uh, found on the news or related to public health and the response on the Twitter. So to see if there is a delay, if there is some possibility, not of prediction, but at least of early detection. Uh, another interesting uh, concept is about who is spreading trusted and fake news. There is a clear segregation of these groups and uh, probably at least monitoring or maybe some intervention could be relevant to, to reduce the impact of uh, fake news or uh, negative opinions, for example, regarding vaccination or uh, applying these measures to counteract using the masks uh, and so on. So yeah, Twitter can provide uh, useful information, maybe not all of the possible information, but other social networks are not so easily explorable and other data are not allowed to, to, to be studied, for example, in Europe. So there is a, a, a great difference also about the data that you can deal with in different countries. Because, yeah, intersecting different information would surely be better, but I don't know how many other data we will be able to intersect with Twitter. So uh, the, 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 the answer is country specific, I, I think. Yeah, so maybe, um, so maybe back to Ben, because um, I think, uh, well, as Chuck also explained, we are looking at uh, maybe a novel new model for studying spread of epidemics um, uh, how how do you, what would your you know research question be do you do you think that's possible is that sort of a new way of doing public health investigations or is it incremental uh, change of the way outbreak investigations are done now? Uh, it's, a, it's a really difficult question. Um, I, I picked up from, from Charles' talk the idea that aerosol transmission is probably more important than has been recognized, at least until recently. I was very happy to see more discussion about that very recently in World Health Organization uh, and in the media. Um, I feel like we still don't understand how most respiratory viruses spread. So we talk about not really knowing how COVID is spreading, but actually we, we still don't really know how flu spreads, how other respiratory viruses spread. Is contact transmission, is, is indirect contact transmission really playing a role? Um, you know, we just don't know. There's so many questions. Uh, we've had 100 years of research on influenza and still not answered the questions for influenza. Uh, with COVID-19, we're six months in and, and, and have exactly the same questions. And uh, I don't know how soon we'll have answers. Uh, you know, if, if indirect transmission through the environment, through survival on fomites, if that's not playing a role, then hand hygiene's also not, not going to be very helpful. But it's one of the, the, the major public health messages from the beginning. Mm -hmm. So dare I ask the question, what about the one and a half meter distancing outdoors? Just a quick view from this panel. I see Chuck uh, crack up. It's 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 un it's unfounded. It, it's a gradient. I I mean, the greater the separation distance, the lower the risk. But there's not an absolute uh, boundary. Outdoors, it would be inverse square or inverse cube as well, right? 
Well, yeah, yeah, to some degree, uh, depends whether you're a point source or line source, but greater distance, you're safer. But the, I, get, I guess here that it is the translating the science to a an understand a clear, a, a simple public health message is the big challenge, isn't it? Um, <clears throat> So, the, I mean, the, there, there's a word that has been used a lot in communication, and that's protect. And I think there's been a problem with the use of that word, because to many people, the word protect implies I'm safe. And it doesn't convey the idea that there's a gradient. And I think that's been an unfortunate issue um, in risk communication. Okay. So, Patricia... From your perspective, uh, can the, you on this? Well, I think the public is getting an insight into um, some of the tensions that's existed and the nuances that's existed in science that we, that be kept in journals and closed meetings is now out there. You know, the idea that actually lots of these things are much more nuanced than they're communicated, um, and that sometimes they can appear arbitrary. Um, and there's a lot more tensions in, in science and in our decision making than, than sometimes it can appear to the public. So I think this 1.5 meter and, you know, whether it's two, whether it's one, um, is a, one of those interesting things that from the public perspective um, can, can seem quite arbitrary. Um, and that's because I think what COVID has done is it's, it's opened up the public uh, to a lot of the uh, lack of consensus and the nuance that science are, are dealing with. Okay, well, um, I think with those uh, words, let me hand this over to David to summarize. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I think this is that's very challenging uh, to do. Um, what, what, what I'd like to do first is thank thank all of the, the speakers and all of the panelists for really an excellent discussion. Um, uh, thank uh, Dr. Dr. Kaushik and Dr. Yazdan, uh, Yazdan Pana for their stewardship of GLOPID uh, R. And again, again, thank uh, jo Josie and, and uh, Gail and uh, uh, Giuseppe for an excellent uh, session. I, I'm going to double down on what I said when we started off, that a lot of the challenge here relates to the fact that we focus on the pathogen and we regard disease as a function of the pathogen because I think we're hardwired to think about Koch's postulates, the pathogen equals disease, we give it to a rat, we give the rat disease, we take it from the rat and give it to another, another rat and that's how disease works. And I think that what we are seeing now is yet another kind of duality which is that there are commonalities between this epidemic and other epidemics going back to 1918 in terms of how human beings are hardwired to uh, respond. And that's challenging. And now we have this whole other layer of technology and communication and misinformation and uh, desa informatia and, uh, uh, and, and as well as the ability to see things in a way that they couldn't see things in 1918. I mean, they couldn't sequence, they, they couldn't grow viruses, much less sequence them. So I'll end by saying, you know, I, I think this is, you, you know, when Charles Dickens, he says it was the best of times, it was the worst of times when he talks about the French Revolution. This is the worst of times. And I fear that this fall is going to, I think that this is a, dark thing to say. I think most of the people who are going to die in this pandemic are still alive. So I think this is a very dark time that we are heading into. From a science point of view, I wish everyone on the call and all of your families and, and all of your friends well, and I hope we all see the other side of this. We've already lost some friends, I know, in the infectious disease community. Um, but I think from a science point of view, setting aside the emotion and setting aside the sadness and setting aside the both health and economic loss, it is the richest opportunity that we've had in some time to really understand pandemics. And I don't think this is a one-off. I think this is a, 
this is an exemplar of the paradigm. And those of us like people like Marion have been talking about this for 20 years, that this is what a pandemic would look like. It would come from animals, it would break out, it would move around the world very fast. We would scramble for a vaccine because we hadn't bothered to develop a vaccine ex ante. Uh, so, th so, th so this is fitting the script of contagion because you know, contagion the movie was made with input from people like, like Marion and others on this call. So, you, you know, the darkness of this is not something that we can negotiate away or wish away. And I think that those of us who work in science, and I consider epidemiology a science, those of us who <laughs> work in science need to make the most of this very dark time and learn as much as we can, because I don't think it's the last that we'll deal with in our lifetimes. But thank you, everyone, for what, what a wonderful way to spend the morning in Canada, or I suppose the afternoon where many people are, hopefully not the middle of the night, uh, although I think for some people it is the middle of the night. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, David. Thank you, Marianne. So uh, I have to say that this session was really extremely important, uh, extremely interesting. Although, David, uh, I probably agree with your conclusion that uh, this is uh, that we have difficult times uh, in front of us, not only behind us, but in front of us. But I, I think that we we should uh, we should still have some uh, hope <laughs> to try to change things. If not without hope, we cannot actually continue. So we should have some hope. Anyway, th thanks a lot uh, to to everyone. Thanks. Uh, really to all the panelists, to all the presenters, and all those who, who, who attended. We have uh, almost 200 people who attended this meeting, which is a lot, and very high level uh, uh, discussions. I personally learned a lot. So just to, to let you know that we have two additional sessions now, the session four, which is tomorrow at the same time, which is on social sciences. And at, as we learn today, it will be extremely important also for the future. Uh, and we will have a panel discussion on uh, Thursday. As always, Marion say, we should do the cross-cutting, we should do trans uh, transdisciplinary, and that is what we're going to do on, uh, on uh, Thursday. So please be there. Thanks to everyone, also to Charu, to Gail, to Josie, huge work, and see you on to tomorrow or Thursday. Charu. Thank you so much. Thanks, Yastin, and thanks to the co-chairs. Wonderful, very stimulating discussions. I'll just Sorry. join everybody in thanking and uh, invite everybody to come back. These sessions are continuing, and we have a great uh, summary discussion panel coming up on uh, Thursday. Uh, so thanks, everybody. And, uh, you know, I'll uh, and maybe on a cheerful note, David, to take away from the dark times. <laughs> you know, my Sorry. client said at the end of uh, WHO meeting that, uh, some of us might have trained for this moment all our lives and some of us might actually make a difference. So let's hope that uh, all of us working together will actually make a difference uh, and maybe we'll uh, lighten some of the dark times. Take care everybody and enjoy the day. Bye-bye.